Good evening and welcome to the April 13th, 2021 Gilderland Central School District Board of Education meeting. Would you all please silence your cell phones and recite the pledge? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice, and justice. Okay, so first on the agenda tonight, we have two public comments. And the first public comment um, is for me. It's, it's uh, in two parts. One second here. Um, this first part is from an email exchange I had with Mr. Mike DeLuke. He asked me to read a specific part of my email to him, and I agreed. So here goes, quote, when Mr. DeLuke's letter was read, I said I was invited. I said I invited Mr. DeLuke to attend a meeting, and he declined. What actually happened is that I invited him to work with the subcommittee, and he said yes. The subcommittee um, didn't reach out yet because they're just getting organized. I misspoke because I did not remember our email exchange correctly. My mistake is for responding on the spot. I apologize for misspeaking and any extraordinary distress this has caused Mr. Duluth. Uh, the second part of my comment is on the support of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism work of the school district. With the exception of a few leaders in this district, there's this lack of strong leadership in addressing racism. There are, many there are many articles and letters written in the Altamont Enterprise in the summer of 2020 addressing the change that was supposed to come, and there's no doubt that this work is challenging. However, there was an understanding, or at least I thought so, that we would need to be strong in the face of pushback. There are quotes from the district like, quote, if we do not seize this moment to make real changes, shame on all of us, unquote. There is another quote, I think we need this is how we move forward as a nation and as a community. I always talk about, we're here for all kids. I want to make sure we're here equally for all kids, unquote. The enterprise also stated that they've written many times about black students who felt the discrimination against them wasn't recognized by the school staff building. In response to questions we are now receiving about the importance of this work, I asked how many incidents have to take place until the Gilman School District starts to be proactive beyond performative activism. The district needs to ask itself, why is this existence of this work perceived as a threat? In a speech from Tony Morrison in 1975, she talks about racism and how it distracts you from doing your work. Let's stop being distracted and start doing the work. The second public comment is from I apologize, I need to make this bigger. Um, this is from Kelly Abruzzi. Is she frozen? Do you want me to read it, get started? Go ahead, if you have it right in front of you, Gloria. I do. Uh, dear board members, I am writing to you as a concerned parent in the Gilderland District about the proposed changes to the school start times for next year. During the pandemic, start times in our district were dramatically altered to accommodate transportation and social distancing. And those changes, excuse me, had a significant impact on a large percentage of our student population. Before yet another change is bestowed upon them, I would encourage the board to consider the following concerns. First, many families were negatively impacted by having the elementary school start earlier than the high school because they had planned on older students being available for after school care. Some of these families had already endured financial hardships from the pandemic, and this only exacerbated their situation. Two, young students were getting picked up on the bus before 7 a.m. during the winter months before even daylight, when they were just adapting and acclimating to school just as kindergartners. Three, high school students had limited opportunities for employment due to such a late dismissal. Restaurants and other local businesses have struggled to provide them with opportunities because they are not available at the needed times. Many, many times students with food insecurities rely on these, this income for their next meal. Four, students who needed additional help were unable to stay after or had limited times to ask for additional instruction. Five, student athletes were having to leave earlier than normal and missed crucial in-school, in-classroom time in order to participate in games or meets 
especially when they were at suburban council schools who did not modify their start, start times and typically started before 8 a.m. Six, later start times created conflicts and overlaps for high school students who participated in extracurricular activities, which forced them to make difficult choices between them, although they were encouraged to diversify their involvements for college applications. I understand that previous sleep studies about adolescents have been evaluated, but have those studies been updated to include data from the past year? Isn't the board obligated to consider all students in the district before making such sweeping changes that impact so many and not in a favorable light? Why would our district not want to be in a more alignment with other districts in our area? In reading the thought exchange after the new start times were proposed as part of the budget, I believe by the responses that many other families in the district share the same questions and concerns. Over the course of this past year, the students have had to adapt to these changes, virtual learning and too many other things even to list. Why would we want to create yet another upheaval in their lives by making changes to the start times when the original start times were working fine for generations before COVID? Instead of trying to make this type of change at the end of the school year when the community is unable to meet and discuss, I would encourage the board to return our district to the pre-COVID schedule for the next year and allow our children to get back to some normalcy. Thank you, Kelly Abruzzi. Thank you, Gloria. Um, are there any more public comments that came in, Linda? No. No, okay, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we have the consent items. These include the minutes um, from the March 16th and the March 23rd uh, Board of Ed meetings, the CPSC and CSC recommendations, uh, personnel action, and the financials A through G. We have a motion to accept the consent agenda. So moved. Barb, second, um, Blanca. Are there any questions? Not all in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 9 0. Thank you. Uh, I think Judy is not here. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, passes 8 0. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have information items, uh, curriculum and instruction. Uh, Dr. Singleton. Thank you, Dr. Rivera. Uh, the first item, the only item I have tonight is that the University at Albany recently launched the Capital District Leadership Award, which is designed to recognize students with a passion for leadership and noteworthy service experiences. After interviewing finalists, 10 students were recognized as Capital District leaders, receiving $7,000 per year, and 20 freshmen were recognized as Capital District fellows at $3,000 per year. In addition, all of the finalists were recognized with a $1,000 annual scholarship. The selection committee was inspired while reading the essays and recommendations for all students who applied for this distinction. And I am pleased to share with you that three Gilderland students have been named as recipients. And they are Jessica Arambua, who has been selected as a capital district leader to receive the $7,000 annually, equivalent to $28,000. Likewise, for Shashank Shamshavad, who has been selected again as a capital district leader at 7,000 annually and an equivalent of $28,000. And Kari Yamaguchi, who has been selected as a capital district fellow to receive $3,000 annually, equivalent to $12,000. The UAlbany campus community looks forward to the contributions these students will bring to UAlbany and the role that they will play as peer leaders. So congratulations to Jessica Shashank and Kari. Well deserved. Thank you, Dr. Singleton. You're welcome. Next, we have uh, board president information. Uh, the first item I have is voter registration required for the May 18th, uh, 2021 uh, Board of Election, the school budget and board of election vote. Voter registration is required in the Gilwin School District to vote. You must be 18, a US citizen is a, and a resident in the Gilwin School District for at least 30 days prior to the vote. If you are not registered with the school district or Albany uh, County Board of Elections, you must do so prior to the vote. Um, there are links there for Albany uh, County Board of Elections, or you can do that through the DMV. Uh, the district has established three registration dates for residents to vote at the May 18, 2021 budget vote and election. You may register anytime between 8.30 and 2.30 at one of the elementary schools or from 8.30 to 4.30 at the district office on the following dates, Thursday, May 6th, Monday, May 10th, and Tuesday, May 11th. 
If you are not sure which elementary school to vote, please refer to our webpage link, Budget and Taxes, and use the link that drops down uh, to voter eligibility and absentee ballots. Um, you can see if you're registered in where you vote for school elections. The next item is the Capital Region BOCES, BOCES uh, Budget and Board election vote that will take place uh, next Wednesday, April 24th, uh, April 21st, sorry, to, uh, 2021. There are two seats up for election and our special Board of Ed meeting will take place at 8 a.m. For, um, for that meeting. And lastly, the upcoming Board of Education election. Um, the petitions are available through the district clerk for any district resident who might be considering to run for the Board of Ed. 82 signatures of eligible district voters are required based on the 2% of voting in 2019. There are three three-year terms on the board that will begin July 1st. And in order to run for the Board of Ed, you need the petitions with 82 or more signatures from qualified voters. Um, and they need to be returned to uh, the district office or the district clerk by April 19th, 2021 by 5 p.m. Anyone who has questions about the duties and respons uh, responsibilities of a board member may contact the superintendent, board president, or any current member of the Board of Ed. To be a candidate, you must be able to read, write, be at least 18 years of age, a qualified voter, and a district resident for at least one year prior to the vote on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Further information um, you can find from the district clerk and the district office. Uh, next on the agenda are action items. Uh, first up, we have school business, Neil. Neil, you're mute. Doing well up till now. Sorry about that. Um, uh, first item of this evening is an internship agreement, and that's with Grand Canyon University to accept students for internship and practicum experience. Okay, can I have a motion to accept the internship agreement? Ben, second, Gloria. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 8 0. Uh, next item in this agreement uh, to approve the agreement with St. Catherine's Center for Children. Hey, can I have a uh, motion to approve the service agreement with St. Catherine's? Uh, Blanca, second, Barb. Any questions? Well, all in favor? Aye. Passes 8 0. Uh, next is a recommendation to appoint Dr. Warren Silverman of Access Compliance LLC as medical director for a 36 month term, effective July 1st, 2021 to June 30th, 2024, with the option to extend the agreement for two additional years upon mutual agreement between the parties. Can I have a motion to approve the appointment of the medical director? Gloria? Second, Blanca? I just I have a question about oh. that. Go ahead. Um, so how does that work? Do we get more than one applicant or how does that work? Uh, we solicited um, vendors and we had identified four that could provide the service, some that have some that reached out to us and others that we were aware of. Um, they, they received a packet of, of requirements, obligations that they would have to complete under the uh, contract and only one of them was returned. We did have one returned uh, that did not meet the deadline, so we did not open it. We returned uh, that okay. late, late one to them. I was just curious as to the process. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Passes 8-0. Uh, next, we have an installment purchase agreement with Capital Region BOCES. Um, for uh, the purchase of computers. This is a program that we've initiated between our fifth graders and our ninth graders where they will receive a new device uh, upon entering those two grade levels and they will keep that device for four years. Uh, so this is an ongoing process we have where we're working with an installment purchase agreement to buy uh, new computer equipment over time and equip our students with one-to-one -one devices. Okay, can I have a motion to accept the purchase agreement for the computers? Ben, second, Rebecca. Any questions? Oh, Barb? Yeah, I have a quick question. Did the computers for our grade school children ever come in? I know they were back ordered and like people that had multiple children were suffering because, you know, each of the kids couldn't be on. 
Uh, did those ever come in? We just got them about two weeks ago and they're oh. ready to be distributed. So that was a long back order from July 1st up until a couple of weeks ago. So they have just come in. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? All in favor? Okay, class is eight zero. Uh, next item is a resolution to approve budgetary transfers totaling $71,982 as identified in your materials. Okay, can I have a motion to accept the general fund transfer? Kelly, second Gloria, any questions? Okay, all in favor? Passes 8 0. Uh, next, uh, we actually have uh, three scholarships that are being established, so we'll do them one by one. The first one is the Summer Lee Smith Scholarship, and that would be awarded to a student pursuing a career in the human services field or social work that has demonstrated compassion to others and is active in the community. Hey, can I have a motion to approve the, um, the Lee Smith Scholarship? Blanca, second, Rebecca. Any questions? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Motion passes 8-0. Uh, next is the approval to form the Martin Beifenberger Scholarship. That would be awarded to a high school senior who is kind, compassionate, hardworking, and enjoys life to the fullest. The recipient of this award exemplifies compassion toward others, positivity, and a desire to make a positive impact in the community around them. Can I have a motion to approve this scholarship? Gloria, second Barb. Any questions? All in favor? It passes 8 0. And then finally, we have an, an from Tenai Group Insurance a scholarship that will recognize a senior who will be entering into a four year college or university degree program. The recognized student should be well rounded, shows a drive to work and give back to the community while maintaining good grades and academic involvement. Can I have a motion to approve the 10 Act Group Insurance Scholarship, Blanca? Second, Rebecca. Any questions? All in favor? Class is 8-0. And we certainly thank all of those um, donors who have established scholarships. Uh, really appreciate that for our students. Uh, next, we have internal audit reports. So it's a resolution to accept the annual risk assessment and special area internal audit reports on state aid prepared by Questar 3 BOCES and also to approve the corresponding corrective action plans as recommended by the audit committee. Hey, can I have a motion to approve the audit report and the corrective action plan? Uh, ben, second um, Blanca, any questions? All in favor? It passes 8 0. And then finally, this evening, we have a donation of a snare drum from Randy Batalagi. Again, we're very appreciative of that. Can I have a motion to approve the donation of the snare drum? Rebecca, second Gloria. Um, any questions? Just thank you for the donation. All in favor? The motion passes 8 0. Thank you, Neil. Next on the agenda, we have Superintendent Action, um, Dr. Wiles. Okay, thanks, Dr. Rivera. So, um, this is the portion of our agenda where we'll um, work on coming to some agreement on our spending plan for the 21 22 school year. Here's the kind of the plan for our conversation. Um, we have a brief PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Sanders is going to walk us through that highlights some of the or the key features of the enacted state bu budget that was passed last week um, and the implications of those um, changes from the executive budget to the enacted budget and their implications for us. So we'll start there. Um, this presentation also includes our recommendation for uh, kind of where we land with the budget, and then we'll open it up for discussion. 
Um, I know in the intervening days, um, many of you have sent questions to us and we appreciate those. And because of that, we have some guests with us this evening prepared to talk about um, some of those topics. So Mr. Piscatelli from the high school, Mr. Laster from the middle school, and Lisa Knowles, our PPS director, are joining the district office team to assist with questions. The other thing I just wanted to mention for our viewers, um, the school start time topic is a hot topic and I know a lot of people are interested in it. Um, and I know that we shared that topic as part of the um, budget presentation a few weeks back. Um, however, that is not a decision the board needs to make tonight as part of uh, adopting the spending plan for 21-22. Um, um, in response to some of the concerns that have come our way, we have brought together a plan for our task force to meet and they'll be doing that next week. Um, and then we'll have some information from that task force effort to share with the board. And then the board can, you know, deliberate around that new information shortly thereafter. So I didn't want anyone to be disappointed if we didn't arrive at a, at a decision on that very, um, you know, and very important topic tonight. So, um, Having said that, I will share my screen and turn it over to uh, Mr. Sanders. So just give me one moment here. Okay, can everyone see that? All right, Mr. Sanders, I will turn it to you. Okay. Well, tonight uh, we're going to be talking about adoption of the budget, and this is board adoption. So uh, when the board adopts the budget, that will be the final budget that will go before the voters in May. So we have a presentation tonight. We're going to touch on a few topics, things that have changed uh, since the last time we spoke about the budget. Uh, first thing we'll talk about is foundation aid and why is foundation aid so important? And this goes back actually to 1993 and something called the Campaign for Fiscal Equity when um, it was argued that students were being deprived of a constitutional right to a sound basic education due to inadequate funding in New York State. That lawsuit went back and forth for 13 years before Campaign for Fiscal Activity finally prevailed. And the legislature, state legislature at that point, moved to enhance uh, funding in 2007 for schools. And there was a four year plan to phase that in um, started with the first two years and then the Great Recession hit. Everything got put on the back burner again as, as that was dealt with. Um, and now we find ourselves 13 years from that point where we still have not ever fully realized foundation aid that was promised back in 2007. So what's happening now is an attempt to fully fund foundation aid after all these years. The way it's been designed in the enacted state budget is that it would be a three-year phase in. So in the first year, which is the year that's coming up, 2021, what the, the total amount of foundation aid that the school district is owed is 20.9 million. So in 2021, the current school year, we received 15, just a little over $15 million. That means we're still owed under the formula 5.8 million. So what would happen for next year is the state would phase in a portion of that in our case, it's 26.25%, or about $1.5 million. That would bring our foundation aid up to 16.6 million, leaving us to be fully funded another 4.3 million. And in year two, under the current plan, again, starting at the top, our $20 million target, we have $16 million, we're owed 4.3. At this point, that remaining balance of 4.3 million in year two, the state would give us half of that that's owed. So about 2.1 million, that would bring our total foundation allocation up to 18.7 million and leaving us with the remaining half of 2.1 million. And in the third year, the plan is for that remaining 2.1 million to be funded. At that point, we would be fully funded at 20.9 million which leads to the question of what happens in 2024-25. And again, that remains to be determined. The plan right now is a three-year plan. Uh, the only thing that we have to be very cautious of is it's a plan. 
Uh, we know what the funding will be for next year. That's That's been allocated at this point. We hope the state will continue to meet its um, obligation in the remaining two years as it's rolled out. But at this point, those budgets have not been adopted. So we don't know for sure how that's going to roll out over the following second and third years. So we did get an additional state aid and want to show you the comparison between what we had in the budget in the current year and what that means in terms of additional state aid for next year. So in terms of foundation aid, as I mentioned, we're going from 15.1 million to 16.6 million. Uh, BOCES aid is relatively flat, about 1.5 million. The same with text software library and textbooks, around $400,000 still. Hardware and technologies in the same arena at 68,000. Transportation is slated to go up from 3.8 million to 4.3 million. Our excess cost that covers students with disabilities uh, going up from 1.2 million to 1.3 million and building aid is expected to increase a little bit as well from 2.9 million to just over 3 million. So our total state aid is going from 25.1 million to 27.2 million. So that is a significant increase for the school district in terms of a state aid allocation of just over $2 million. As you know, we also have federal aid that's been allocated to the school district, and this is separate and apart from state aid. So the state aid we just talked about, this is a separate bucket of money uh, for federal aid. They're not tied together anymore as they were under the original executive budget proposal. The first piece is the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. That's 4.6 million that's allocated to our school district, and it covers all costs incurred from March 13th, 2020, almost a year ago, to September 30th, 2022. And we also have the American Rescue Plan Act funds. That's $2.8 million. That covers costs, again, from the same starting point, March 13th, 2020, the onset of the pandemic, but it goes a year longer than the Coronavirus Response and Relief Package. It goes through September 30th, 2023. And what you'll note from earlier, the, the earlier proposed budget, the executive budget proposal, there was a New York State local funding adjustment that was offsetting this federal money, at least the, the coronavirus response and relief amount. That reduction has been removed in the final budget deliberations. So we are no longer going to receive see that reduction of 4.1 million uh, in the final state budget. And it's important to note that all of these funds, federal funds, must be applied for using a grant application process. That process is still being developed. Uh, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, so this is all very new in terms of the final state budget and federal aid coming out at this time. So as we understand it, we'll need to submit requests for funding and they will need to be reviewed and approved before we get any money that's released to the school district. So that's the process as we understand it right now. And again, that process is still under development. Um, we've touched on this before, but I think it's a good reminder, what can we use the federal aid for? Uh, there's specific items that we can use the aid for, so it's not a general pot of money we can use as we wish. We have to apply for the grant and the, grant, and the application has to comply with the allowable uses. Uh, the first is addressing learning loss, Second is student mental health supports. And then there's after school and summer learning programs. And then we have some activities to address unique needs such as low income students, students with disabilities, English learners, racial and ethnic minorities, homeless students and foster care youth. There's also an allocation. We can also use this to, to purchase hardware and software for remote and hybrid learning, uh, purchasing personal pr protective equipment and cleaning and disinfecting supplies air quality and ventilation improvements, improving preparedness efforts and coordination, and then planning for hopefully what we won't have to do, uh, but school closures, there is money in there to plan for that if needed. Uh, there's another line item on our state aid run that's for you. Did you have a question, Blanca? Um, yes, thank you, Neil. Um, 
the funding opportunity for improving preparedness efforts and coordination. Is that specific to infectious disease pandemic stuff or does that apply to other emergency preparedness topics? Um, from what I've seen, it's along the lines of the pandemic, but we haven't seen detailed regulations. So it's 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 general, but I have seen the, the word pandemic in in association with that item. So again, it may cover more than that, but it seems to be the intent of, of the language to be along those lines. I think Barbara, you have a question? I okay. Muted Barbara. Okay. Um, this looks like it's gonna be an awful lot of paperwork. Uh, who's going to be responsible for all that paperwork? I know uh, Damien has done a lot of the uh, hardware and software stuff, but my goodness, you have the learning programs, mental health supports. Are we divvying this up amongst our administrators? Or who in heaven's name is going to do air quality and ventilation improvements? I mean, it looks like a ton of paperwork that's going to take forever. Well, Barbara, we haven't seen any of the requirements yet, so we don't know for sure how detailed that is. I'm sure there's going to be some level of detail. I think you're right. It's going to touch in a number of areas under different aspects of leadership. So I could see a number of people, several of them on this call probably, that will be involved depending on whatever the area is. Lisa Knowles, if we're, if we're talking about something related to um, students with disabilities or mental health issues. Uh, Damien certainly will have a I think a significant role in some of the educational aspects and also in terms of technology. I see Cliff Nooney, our facilities director, if we're going down the road of air quality and ventilation improvements. Uh, Tim Murphy's involved a lot in our school district with emergency preparedness and in, in those types of efforts. So I think as we explore how we might want to use the funding, identify our priorities, then we'll be tapping those individuals that are best suited to help assist with identifying the needs and then following through on the grant application process. I know Lisa has done a number of grant applications as well and is very familiar with the process. Damien's down a number. So we have some people around us who are very experienced with the grant application process and what's required. They didn't make it easy. Uh, no, grant processes usually aren't. Neil, so just as a point of clarification, because uh, this is a grant, it doesn't directly go into our budget as a revenue because we have to apply for it later and we may or may not get it? Uh, that's correct. Uh, again, as we understand it, there's something called a special aid fund that we can uh, utilize and that's what's being recommended at this point. So um, it would not go into the general fund. Um, so we, we also have a time limit with the general fund. You know, you have to use it within the current year. Um, otherwise, we have more difficulty in terms of managing that money going forward. So everything that will happen through, through, the, through the federal aid will be out of the special aid fund, the separate fund, separate apart from the general fund, our general operating budget. Okay, thank you. Barbara has another question. Yep. I do. Just, just a quickie. Uh, something like student mental health supports. Could we um, use those funds for the new psychologist that's in the budget, or is it separate from that? I don't know if I can answer your question directly um, because we haven't seen exactly what's allowed under the different categories. So again, we haven't received any guidance that says these are the, you know, these are broad general allowable uses. So we haven't yet seen anything in detail telling us exactly what could or couldn't be funded under a particular arena at this point in time. As I understand it, these federal funds are separate from our budget, correct? Or am I mistaken? No, that is correct. And, and they'll be accounted for separately um, separate and apart from, from the general fund, which is our annual operating budget. So this is completely off to the side and that allows us to have that multi-year access to these funds. Barbara, I think the thing to keep in mind is that these funds do run out um, depending on which 
bucket of money. One is done in September of 22 and the other is September of 23. So really the way people are starting to think about this is using these funds for non-recurring costs. Um, because if we were to use them for personnel, then when the money goes away, we would have to pick up those ongoing costs through the, the general fund. So those are some of the things we'll need to, to sort through. Okay. Luciana? Oh, I'm sorry, I kept it up from before. No, no worries. And then um, Seema, your question, do you wanna just state it here? I've got too many things open. Oh, sure, it just says, um, well, I maybe Barb already clarified that. So the federal funds already earmarked for something else and they're not necessarily something we are going to be talking about in our budget, correct? Yes. Yeah, that, that's correct. <laughs> Kelly, did you have a question? Hi, I do have a question. Um, so from what I understood so far, we have a $1.5 million increase in federal, uh, foundation aid for this year. And I, I have another question about the New York State local funding adjustment reduction that was eliminated from the enacted from the enacted budget. So does that does that mean that we the budget that we saw, the superintendent budget uh, from a couple of weeks ago, withhold withheld four million dollars because we didn't think we were gonna get it, but now we're getting it. Is that true? That's state money? Is that what that means? Yeah, there was um, there was an allocation of federal money uh, the way it was proposed, and then an offset that was a reduction of state money. So basically, okay. the way the proposal was provided through the executive budget proposal is federal money money coming in, and basically reduce the state came back and said we're going to reduce our obligation uh, to fund expenses because you're getting the federal money in. We're gonna we're gonna pull away some of our state funding. But and, but they didn't do that, right? In, in the final budget, which is what we're discussing tonight, no, they did not do that. So that went away, the, the reduction, uh, the state money that was going away didn't go away. So does that mean we actually have 5.5 million more than what we thought a couple of weeks ago in state money? Or no? no or is that no, it's, about, it, it's about an increase of about 2 million from year to year, from what we have in, in this year's budget to next year's budget. So there was a mix of state aid combined with federal aid in the in the state budget proposal. So now it's okay. separated, it's separated out. Uh, so the federal federal aid came out and the state offset came out as well. Okay. I may have more questions. I'm just kind of struggling through it at the moment, but thank yeah. you. Yeah, the budget changed budget changed quite a bit from the executive proposal to the final enacted budget by the state. So that wasn't the only change. Another way to think about it, Kelly and, and others, is that in the um, executive budget, the two pots of money were mixed, state money and yeah. federal money. So um, in the enacted budget, they separated those two things out. Okay. It's okay. complicated. I'm going to keep thinking. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another uh, topic that's come up because it appeared on our state aid run is a universal pre-K. And that is not something that the current, currently the district uh, offers or has, has offered in the past. Uh, but again, like I said, it was on our state aid run. Uh, as part of the state budget, a total of 105 million was allocated for the expansion expansion of universal pre-K, and this is across all school districts. 90 million will be through a grant process. There was another 15 million approved that that's on a competitive basis. So, as we understand it, everybody is eligible with the nine, that are part of the 90 million. There's also another 15 million that is available on a competitive basis. So, on our aid run. For Gilderland, we have an allocation of $626,400 to implement universal pre-K. We didn't get any real notice that this was coming. So any of the budget discussions, nobody seemed to indicate that this was 
uh, on the table and was something that was likely to happen. So we were surprised um, along with many others when we got our allocations and saw that amount on the aid run. So what we've been trying to do is find out more information about what this actually means. Um, and one of the challenges we're finding right off the bat is um, we haven't really received any, any clear guidance from SED about this pot of money that's now allocated to us. So uh, that's supposed to be forthcoming. So we'll have a much better handle on what that actually means when we get to see some of the, the guidance and regulations around that. Uh, things that we do know though, that the legislation only provides the funding for the 2021 and 2022-23 school year. So it's only for two school years that we have the money. It's not clear what happens after that point. Um, also, there's a requirement to serve a minimum number of children. And if we're not able to meet that minimum number of children, we don't receive all of the funding that's been shown on, on the run. Uh, so I think in one instance, the, the threshold is 20 students. In another instance, it's 18 students. It's so somewhere between 18 and 20 students um, for a class. And we would have to be able to to have that many students in order to receive full funding. Anything less, we would receive less funding. Um, some of the challenges we've identified already in, uh, is you know, having sufficient space if we were to do it in our school buildings, where, where would we house those programs and do we really have that space available to us? Uh, transportation is another issue. Some schools that have implemented a universal pre-K program do provide transportation as we understand it. Um, we're not obligated to provide transportation. If we did, um, we certainly could use money to, to do so. Um, the other thing that we learned this afternoon is that we also can partner with another agency. So um, we don't necessarily have to run the program ourselves. We would still have to be the administrator of the program, but we could partner with an outside agency and that outside agency could provide the building space and the program we would be obligated to provide the oversight though and be responsible for the program, but it wouldn't be necessarily have to be in our, in our buildings and under our direct daily control. So I think we're gonna have more information to come on that right now. It's like I said, it's, it just came as part of the budget. Uh, we haven't really received all the information. We're trying to learn as much as we can and um, we'll have to discuss what the options are. So we have a couple of hands raised. Um, Rebecca? Um, I think you might have already answered this, Neil, but maybe I missed it. We're using the word grant a lot. And in my world, grants are something you apply for and sometimes but don't often get. Is this the same sort of like the federal funding that you, you mentioned two slides ago and then this? Is, is this like that, that you would apply for and then you may not potentially get it? Or are these sort of guaranteed if you go through the application process? Uh, the way I understand it right now is we're, we're guaranteed, but I think they need a mechanism to make sure that, you know, we're meeting the requirements of the program. So I think what they want to do is uh, have a process to follow so they can make sure that um, we're meeting all of the requirements and apply for it. So we have the space, uh, we have everything in place. It, it is very stringent, and as you can imagine, in dealing with children, the requirements that have to be met from a facilities point of view, from an instructional point of view, from a health and safety point of view. So I think the state is going to want to see that we have all of those pieces in place that they would want to see and everything is adequate. So I think that's where the grant part comes in is that there would be an application process, making sure we've uh, met all the requirements and are able to, to do the program in conformance with the requirements of the state. Uh, but as we understand it, we do have an allocation for our school district. So it's a question of whether we utilize the allocation or not. Okay, thank you. And then Blanca, did you have your hand up? No. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about the recommendations for this evening in the following slide, but um, just wanted to kind of preset the board to a conversation that we've we've had in previous budget presentations, and that's where we rank in terms of our fund balance as a percentage of our overall revenue. 
You've seen this slide before. This is from 2019. It compares all the schools in suburban council. And it shows that Gilderland has the lowest amount of fund balance in terms of as a percentage of overall revenue from of all 13 schools in the suburban council. So um, we should understand that in terms of having enough savings, and this is really what we're talking about, having enough savings, uh, we are we have the least amount of savings of every other suburban council school in the area. So that certainly is a factor that we need to look at in terms of long-term financing. Yes, Kelly. Sorry, I have a quick question. This this reads to me as fund balance as a percentage of rev of revenue. Like in my world, in my thought process, that means that we use less amount of money from our fund balance to do our operations. We take that. That's how that reads to me. Is that not? That's not. That's, that's the opposite. But that's how it yeah. reads to me. Yes. Um, I want to make sure that that's yes. not what we meant. Well, we can allocate fund balance as part of a, as, as a revenue source. So the tax levy is one revenue source. We can have fund balance. We have state aid as a revenue source. So the, those all contribute to uh, potential sources of revenue to offset expenses. What this chart is demonstrating though is how much, how many, what's the amount of, of resources that we have available to us for that purpose. So it's the total amount of resources that we can accumulate over time um, referred to as, as fund balance. And, it, and if you think of it in your personal life, it's like having savings account. So you have your, you know, you work, you get a paycheck, you have your, your bills, you pay your expenses, but most people also keep a savings account. So uh, money that's above and beyond what they need to use to meet their daily needs, uh, they would keep that aside. You would tend not to use that unless you didn't have enough income to meet your expenses. So it's this works the same with school. So if you don't have enough income to meet your expenses, you gotta make the house payment, the car payment, buy food and groceries and so on and so forth, and you have a savings account, you would need to start drawing on your savings account to make everything balance for the month. I meet all of my expenses, but I'm, I'm drawing each month from my savings account because I don't have enough income to meet all of my expenses. And that's the same sort of opportunity here. You can use that money when you need it because it's sitting there savings. But if you went into a situation where you are constantly drawing from your savings account, the problem is you deplete your savings account. If you don't make any other changes, you don't have a way to increase your savings. If you continue to draw on a monthly basis, eventually it's going to run out. Right. So that what kind of how in my mind, I'm like, OK, we're, we're using 11 percent of our savings every month to pay our bills, which comparatively to this is, is really good but well, I think I'm, not, I think I'm thinking of it opposite <laughs> yeah we're not using 11 percent 11 percent is what we we have available okay. to us that's what's sitting Got in it. our savings Got account it. so to speak that's what uh, I thought it just reads it just reads in my mind a little bit differently I just wanted to clarify that thank you yeah. well we've yeah. allocated in the current year budget not for next year so about six hundred and forty thousand dollars so we we've, we've said we need to take that out of our bank account to balance the overall budget between taxes um, and other sources of revenue like state aid. So as, as a prelude to that, we have some recommended budget adjustments based on the enacted uh, state budget. Um, there's some changes in revenue and changes in expense. So let's start in the superintendent's budget. You know, sides have to balance so both the revenue and expenditure side uh, 504,895,570. That was on the expenditure side, a 1.81% increase. Uh, but as I mentioned, we did get additional foundation aid, 1.5 million. We did get additional aid in our expense driven aids of 89,000. The federal stimulus and local funding adjustment, that piece that was married together, the net of that is an overall reduction in revenue of 547,934. So the federal piece was larger than the local funding adjustment. So by moving that federal aid totally out of the state aid picture, it ends up being a reduction in state aid. So really what we're down to is given all of that, what adjustments would we recommend based on the changes in state and federal aid? Um, what the recommendation is, 
I'll jump to the expense column first is we would um, have an additional $84,000 added to the budget for expanded instructional coaching. On the revenue side though, we would look to reduce our appropriated fund balance and reserves by $988,672. So that's, we have almost a million dollars we're taking from our savings to fund the budget. We have an opportunity here to basically eliminate that. So we would be back in balance again with our budget, which means we're not constantly drawing from our savings to fund our expenses. So we wanna be back in that position of we can afford what we have. We have uh, we don't need to, to have additional money coming out of our savings to, to meet our annual expenses. So if we do that, our budget would increase um, by that $84,000 to 570. That would be a budget to budget increase of 1.89%. An important point here is down at the bottom, the note tax levy will remain at 75 0.9 million. Uh, that hasn't changed as a result of, of these recommendations. And we are at the, the maximum amount that would allow for a 50% majority vote for a past budget. And that leads us to an opportunity to have some discussion about that recommendation. Let me ask this question. Would it be helpful for me to leave the slides available or to close them out and go back to them if we need them? I think it's easier to see people, so I'll close it out. And if I have to go back, I will. Kelly? So with the extra money, it appears we're gonna not have to take out the 600 plus thousand dollars from the fund balance this year, and then we're gonna fund it more by 300,000 or so. So we're taking all the money and putting it into fund balance. I need an extra, and then, well, besides the expanded instructional, instructional coaching, Does that kind of sum it up? Yes, that's correct. So in, in the budget that was the superintendent's budget, we had actually increased that $640,000 of savings applied fund balance, and we increased it to $938,000 or thereabouts. Uh, so we had to increase it uh, to get the balanced budget uh, that we wanted. But this will allow us, again, to take away all of that use of our savings to help balance the budget. Um, so the goal so here is put us in a better position financially for years going forward. Well, next year, won't we have to spend that $600,000 again, since that we have reoccurring costs that we were going to, like for next year's budget, yeah, we funded it a little bit. We have a little bit more into our funds, but don't we, those programs didn't go away, right, for next year that we were funding with that $600,000. So, Correct. Well, next, yeah, next year we'll be, we'll have to see how the budget works out, but it will put us in the position of being at the point where we are not dependent on using our savings, at least in terms of fund balance, we'll still have some for reserves to fund our overall budget. We'll have to see what state aid is at that point. We'll have to see what our expenditures are at that point. And then we would need to make the decision about, can we, can we work and get the revenue and expenses balanced without having to draw from our savings or not. So, but we'll be fine for 2021-22. We won't need to do that. We won't need to use any of our savings to have a balanced budget at that point. With the revenue that we have and the expenses that we've identified, uh, we can meet all of our expenses with the revenue sources that we have. So as far as all the extra money that we're getting, we're adding an extra $84,000 in instructional coaching that's going to go towards the students pretty much. And the rest yeah. this and year. That, yeah, and that was identified in the superintendent's budget. There was a slide that said yeah. if more money became available, what would be our recommended yeah. priorities? And this is a line. Yeah. We have two priorities, and that's what they were, instructional coaching okay. and reduce our reliance on fund balance. Okay. I think Rebecca was next and then Barbara. 
Um, again, I think you might have answered this a minute ago, and so I just think I'm being a little bit um, slow with getting this. But so does what you just presented include the CRRSA or the ARPA funds or any of the universal pre-K funds? Or is that sort of separate because we don't know for sure through the grant process if we're getting them? Um, that is all separate. So that's not part of our general operating budget for next year, what, what we typically focus on. Uh, so all of those funds would be outside of that in what, what we would call a special aid fund. So it wouldn't be commingled with our general fund at all. And those funds are multi-year. So that's the difference. Our operating budget is a single year. All of those other funding sources are multi-year. So that putting in a special aid fund allows us to have that multi-year use of those funds to meet needs over time that we wouldn't have with our general fund. And so coming up with um, um, goals for that funding would be something separate that we would decide. Yes, that is correct. In terms of the federal funds, that okay. would be it. Thank you. I think Barbara and then Seema. Okay, Neil, in our Friday update, you gave a nice explanation of why we're putting the money in the fund balance and the strange state rules that if we actually reduced our budget, we would be in trouble in years to come. Um, could you give a simplified explanation to, to the citizenry, so to speak, because it made a lot of sense, but oftentimes when the state does what they do, it doesn't make any sense. So you have to follow their crazy rules. And if you could just share that a little bit, um, I think it would be helpful because other people would be saying, well, geez, you got all this extra money. You know, why don't you don't go up to the to the limit? And as I said, you had a nice explanation. Well, I think and we can treat this much like we do our personal lives. And, and, you know, and if you went to a financial advisor, what would they recommend that you do? They would recommend that you would get your spending back in line with your income. They would recommend that you would put money away for a rainy day or if an emergency arose. Any financial advisor is going to tell you live within your means and then have money available to you in the event of an emergency uh, that you can access so that you can maintain your lifestyle. And, and work through those particular issues. In the school district, it's, it's no different. We should be working in the same manner. We should be trying to make sure our income and our expenses are in line with each other. But we also need, we know we're de heavily dependent upon state aid uh, for a revenue source. And we've seen that over and over again, the lack of consistency from year to year in terms of what our state aid is going to be. It's, we, we cannot draw a linear line between you know, funding 20 years ago and funding today, the state hasn't made a nice linear line that says you know you get additional state aid each year as your expenses increase. We've had years where expenses increase and state aid has decreased or held flat. So we have seen that uneven nature of knowing that we somehow have to overcome this obstacle or put us in the position where we have to start cutting staff and program and services. Um, and that's, uh, you ask any other educator whether they think that's a good idea when we're trying to transform kids' lives and give them the best opportunities to get a sound education, but not having the resources to be able to do that with. So again, this kind of leads us in, into the same plan, which is, okay, if we have extra money available, a one shot, if you will, because we don't know if this is going to continue or not, and we decide to utilize that money for the purpose of lowering taxes that could just end up putting us back in a position where we have no flexibility going forward should state aid not continue to increase um, so it puts us right back in a situation which we've been through in many cycles uh, before where all right in order to to balance this if we don't have savings to draw from and supplement expenses expenses then we're looking at reductions um, larger class sizes, less opportunities for kids. Um, and kids deserve better than that. They shouldn't have to follow the whims of an economic cycle to determine the quality of education that they receive. So again, what, what this proposal is, is just prudent, sound fiscal management that any fiscal advisor would tell you to do. 
Um, you can say, I got a bonus at work or a stimulus check. You have two choices. You can go spend it or you can save it. Uh, and this is much the same. Um, if you save it, you have it available to you. If you need it down the road, if you spend it, it's gone. And if things don't improve, then you're right back in the same boat. You can't meet your expenses with the income that you have. So, um, you know, I talked a little bit in, in my note about what's good stewardship from the board's perspective. I would say good stewardship is making sure that we have enough fiscal resources not just for the coming year, but for future years as well, so that we can weather some economic storms. We were forced to do that. We've been forced to do that many times in the past. And having that available to us, I think is being a good steward of the taxpayer's money. And again, I mentioned, you know, there is a tax gap in effect that does limit the amount of increase in, in taxes. And that's been in, in effect for a decade. So when we looked at it over time, the average tax increase, tax levy increase is 1.55% over that time. It can never be more than 2%. It's been as low as 0.12%, but over that 10 years, it's averaged 1.55%. So I think we've been responsive to the taxpayers in terms of our budgets, but now we're in a position where we need to regroup a little bit and try to get make sure our savings are bolstered and we have an opportunity to do that to set us up for what we know could be a rocky road still coming. I mean, this, this budget is historic <laughs> in terms of the amount of aid to education. Um, and we should not assume that that historic rate will continue even for next year or the following year and certainly three years out. Well, the other thing, Neil, that um, you know we've experienced is that when you don't have that savings account, your bond rating is depleted and we've experienced that. We've also experienced in the around the 2008 uh, recession that we had to really tap into the uh, savings that we had in order to try to maintain uh, programming. So again, thank you for the explanation. You're welcome. I think I saw Seema and then Blanca. Um, so I just wanted to clarify so the federal funds and the, the discussion about the the funds for universal pre-K, that's not, not something that um, we're voting on tonight, so we don't have to really get further into that until we know more about it, correct? That's correct. Okay. And then do we still have the five, how many is it five on a sign that are in the budget? I forgot. 5.7. And, and that's still the plan is to have those five on a sign. And, yeah. and what, what's the process for that, um, you know, how they're going to be decided upon where they'll go? So I can jump in here. If you could recall back when we um, shared the first draft of the budget, um, one of the one of the charts I showed you were the uh, class sizes across the elementary buildings. So we had six sections across the five buildings that were uh, approaching the upper limit of our class size um, upper guideline. So what we do in the spring months is watch enrollment very, very carefully across the district to see if we have additional students moving in and uh, push some of those classrooms over the guideline. Um, and as we watch those, we may use some of those unassigned positions to create additional sections to manage class size. Um, I don't have to tell any of you that low class sizes is a high priority for our community. We hear about it, no matter how we ask, people really want us to work on that. So that's probably the big piece of the unassigned. Um, but then there are also um, small adjustments to FTEs that come along um, sometimes throughout the year. For example, uh, we might need an extra section of um, Spanish one because a number of students uh, entered the district who hadn't met their Spanish requirement, or we might need an extra section of a health class. So that might be a 0.2 of an FTE or a 0.1 of an FTE. And those, those things happen all year long. Um, this year, when we presented the budget back in March, um, we knew we had some enrollment-driven reductions at the high school. Uh, 1.7 FTEs, um, but we also heard the message that given 
kind of what we're living through right now and the uncertainty of next year that we shouldn't reduce staffing. So we included those in the um, unassigned pool to use for unanticipated needs that may emerge over the summer or when we're back in uh, a new school year in, in September. And we have a process by which um, administrators, they submit little proposals uh, to make a case for why they need an FTE or a portion of an FTE. And we work through that in the through the district office team. So, um, you know, that's, that's the general plan for how we use those. Um, I have a question also about, um, and I think Ben may have brought this up before about the school psychologist, the money for that, and then versus having a, a social worker. Um, but I just want to clarify, can the school psychologist do the same work, the mentoring, the counseling as a social worker? And does the district decide how to, because I know, you know, others um, can't do testing like school psychologists, but how is that, uh, how is that decided upon? Is, does the district essentially assign school psychologists to do testing and not really other counseling or, um, you know, mentoring, that kind of thing? Because it sounds, it sounds like, it sounds like they're um, being used to fill that, you know, the testing piece, but not really getting to the students. Lisa Knowles, this has your name all over it. I figured, I figured. Um, so, um, and I, as you probably noticed from our February 9th um, presentation on all of our mental health providers, there's a lot of overlap in what they can do. As a former school psychologist myself, I uh, started my career as a school psychologist and you know, they're uniquely qualified, one, to provide mental health counseling to students, as well as complete our mandated psychoeducational evaluations. So we do have the ability to meet both those needs with a school psychologist and do have both those needs at the high school level. Historically, Gilderland hasn't used school psychologists to provide school-based counseling. There are many districts and districts I've worked for previously. And when I was a school psychologist, I was the lone mental health provider and did all the counseling and the testing and the chairing of meetings. So we can do a lot and we're trained to do a lot. Um, so the team of counselors, psychologists and social workers would have to work together to look at who requires school-based counseling in the school, who would be best to serve that particular student and the needs of that student as well. And also in addition, our psychologists, um, do a lot of work with our general ed teachers and special ed teachers in terms of behavioral intervention planning, consultation, collaboration, um, also discussing accommodations and modifications and really working with the pre-referral teams to deliver interventions before we identify students with disabilities. So school psychologists have a, a broad depth of training and can do both counseling and testing and as part of their job where social workers cannot do testing, school counselors cannot do testing. So school psychologists, we can get a greater depth of service from that position. And that's why we're requesting a school psychologist. Well, I mean, so we, they can they can do more depth of service because they're able, they're qualified to do that. But the way Gilderman uses it, it sounds like it's specifically more for testing, not so much counseling. Primarily right. testing, consultation, collaboration, designing pre-referral interventions, functional behavior analysis, working with teams. Um, but we can expand that role with knowing the needs we have in mental health supports. It's for, I'm just curious because I guess for years and I feel like I hear from teachers who are advocating for social workers and saying, um, you know, that students really need social workers. They, they need more of that direct contact help. And I don't know, I, I would rather, especially cost less to in the budget to, to support that where it's getting support directly to students versus paying. And I'm not saying that school psychologists can't do more, but it sounds like the model that we're using is more, we're paying them to do the testing. And I understand other people can't do the testing, um, but. And knowing the unique needs we have at the high school and knowing that we are anticipating higher than average referrals for interventions, and especially because of the impact of learning on the pandemic, our school psychologists are working with school-based teams to design three referral interventions, as well as more referrals I anticipate. And we're seeing it regionally, not just in Gilderland for increased testing. So if we have a professional who can do both, we are well equipped to handle multiple needs. And if we only hire a professional who can target one area. And it will give us an opportunity to expand the role and utilize psychologists 
in a, in a greater depth in their skill set beyond just being a diagnostician. So this school psychologist, or at least the one that's being asked for in the budget, is for the high school, correct? Is, correct. Is that, okay. So that would pretty much be for testing then. The way and that, also counseling, both. And to do counseling as well in the yeah. high school. How does that yeah. look like accountability wise? Like, because there's already counselors in the high school, right? There are school counselors, there are three school social workers in the high school, yes, as well. Um, how, so we would look at, as we do currently for students have mandated counseling on student plans, we look at what their needs are, who's best able to serve them and, and distribute the caseloads across our multiple providers. So the psychologist would pick up a portion of a caseload as well. And then okay. we need our school counselors who have, you know, other duties and more general interventions to counsel students who may not have more significant needs, but our psychologists and social workers would be used to target the needs of students who have more, more challenging mental health or behavioral needs in the, in the building. Um, and then I guess this other question is probably more for uh, maybe for Dr. Wiles, but that um, assistant principal position that's being um, in the budget with the point three for, for uh, diversity and equity. What happens if you can't find somebody when you post that position for anybody who has, is, is the posting going to include that they have experience in that? And if, um, and if there's, you know, people that apply that don't have experience, what happens is, does that just change to just an AP position? No, I don't think so. I think whenever we're hiring for a position, we define what it is we're looking for and we keep looking until we find the person with the qualifications to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's reopening a search if we need to. But I think um, our, our commitment to um, focusing on this work and having someone within our team who's designated in that role is really important. So, um, you know, pr presuming when you know, we're at the, um, at the point where we do post the, the position, um, we would be very clear that it's an expectation that a portion of the role would be to uh, lead this work, um, you know, to the extent that a point three can. This is a, a starting point for this conversation. Um, but we would look for a person who had that skill set and that interest um, to fill that role. What would you, I guess, what would you look for in a, in a, an application to show that there's interest and skill set? Like, you know, there's like the checking the box interest, like they're getting it covered versus like a passion to do the work. Well, I, I don't know. Um, whenever we're hiring anyone to do the work. So what are the essential skills, um, and dispositions that would, um, put a person, you know, as a, as a highly qualified person for that role. Um, and I think it's someone who is um, a, attuned to the interests of diversity and equity and has uh, done work in those areas. Um, we certainly want someone who is very much student-centered, um, interested in meeting the needs of, you know, each and every student. We'd also want someone with good collaboration skills who can work across the district with, you know, multiple stakeholders. Um, you know, I'm always looking to hire people who are willing learners um, because we uh, every day we have new things we have to figure out. So how does this person demonstrate his or her capacity to be a learner? Um, you know, and then with that are other leadership skills that we would look for when hiring an assistant principal. So organizational skills, communication skills, teamwork skills, um, you know, knowledge of how schools work. I don't know how um, APs are evaluated. I'm not sure about that process, but so will there be some kind of, I guess, accountability or some plan to review that person, whoever gets hired specifically for that point three? I'm just worried that, you know, people can provide lip service through interviews, all that, you know, like they always do and then nothing happens. So I just feel like this is gonna be, you know, wasted money for this position and the box is checked and nothing is done, you know, 
Well, we have an evaluation process for for all of our um, leaders, and part of that is for each of them to establish um, performance goals each year. And I don't imagine, I can't imagine we wouldn't have a very specific measurable goal for this individual around his or her work in equity and diversity that would be um, purposefully evaluated. Um, that would be true for anyone that we would hire. You know, the other thing we do in our hiring process as well, because we understand that it's, it's one thing to be able to come in and talk about what you think you want to do or what you can do or even what you've done, but it's another thing to actually do it. So as part of every one of our interview processes, we ask each candidate to engage in some kind of an authentic performance task where we see them actually engaged in the work. Now, I haven't yet figured out what that would look like for this particular position, but we absolutely would um, bring in candidates and then ask them to be able to demonstrate in some way their knowledge or expertise um, in this area. I just, I don't have any other questions. I just, you know, still think this is really short-sighted in the um, thinking about this position. I feel like, you know, comments have been made. I, you know, mentioned that in my public comment about actually doing this work and I guess committing to the work is a point three with no real accountability to me is, doesn't really show that there's commitment from the district. So that's, I guess, disappointing. I think Blanca, I think you were next. <clears throat> um, let's see, where was I? I'll start with the tax cap. I'm concerned that we're going back up to the tax cap again. Can you tell me, Neil, how many years in a row we've gone up to the tax cap? Um, not off the top of my head, I can't tell you. More than five, less than five. Uh, to me, it seems like it's pretty often. And so- um, I, I recall a year that we didn't. So just in my time- One more time, Ben? I, I know of at least one in my time here that we haven't. So but we haven't. I, I wouldn't say five years. Okay. I guess- well, I think this is the only time that we have ever gone right to the cap. We've come okay. close on many occasions but this is my only recollection of going right to the cap because the cap is really quite low this year. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just concerned about the optics of everything that Neil said made sense, but this seems to me like it's a unique year, a year where folks have lost their jobs and I don't see the budget or the district reflecting us being particularly frugal. We're talking about hiring an administrator. We didn't, respond to the comments calling for, you know, fewer administrative positions. And um, some folks who've retired were replacing them. And so I, I'm just concerned about those optics that we're one, not listening to our folks out there. And two, we are incrementally raising the taxes like every year is what it feels like to me. And then I know we consider it a success as a board or as a district that only a small percentage of people need to vote on this, but I don't see that as a win. I think that means less people were seeing how they actually feel about this. I'm, I'm concerned about that. I will remain concerned about that probably. That being said, I'm also wondering why, uh, and Lisa, you did a great job of explaining it, but I, I think that we were selling the position as mental health oriented and so I, I sort of am in agreement with Seema. It feels more like the social worker will be utilized less in that manner and more in a different manner. So I'm concerned about that. Barbara? I, I wanted to follow up on the um, administrator that uh, the Seema was concerned about. I guess I'm concerned in a, in a different way. Um, one of the questions that I've been asked by some community members are, 
if you're asking for a diversity educator, um, are you racial profiling the position? I mean, we had Amy in that position and it, she did a phenomenal job. I don't think she had any background in uh, diversity training, but she had a, a great interest in it and really stepped up to the plate and you know did some great work be, before she took her new position. So I, I just really was wondering, do we have to put in that point three? I know Seema wants it, but if you just have an AP position, um, you folks in administration can guide that person in whatever direction the needs arise. Uh, if you're having a lot of more discipline problems because the kids are back in school or whatever, um, you can direct that person to do that. Uh, we obviously have, have a, a serious interest uh, with a number of activities, nice activities happening at the high school uh, with the various committees that have been formed by Amy and the kids. Um, and again, I, I just see you or your leadership and your team certainly being able to, to guide that position just as an AP position, a full-time AP position, and you're not pigeonholing that individual or basically looking for particular talents that a person may have exhibited, you know, before interviewing with you. So I'll just say that I think uh, Mrs. Horalchik or Dr. Horalchik was the inspiration for this because she very much blended the two roles um, really beautifully. Um, so honestly, that's in some ways where the idea came from. I think the difference is that we're hoping that um, the individual would have some designated time to be not just in the high school, but also to do some outreach to our other buildings, particularly our elementary buildings. Um, so that is the point of the designation. And I know um, Mike Piscatelli and his team have done some work looking at the roles and responsibilities across the three AP positions so that that could um, happen in a way that's just not by chance. So can I have Mike jump in and maybe talk a little bit about that work? Cause it might make it more concrete. Yeah, one of, we met as a building administrative team and we kind of reviewed all, we took it as an opportunity to look at all the AP responsibilities and um, one of the things we tried to do is we looked at the timing of when some of the major events happen and also consider when does professional development mostly happen in our district. And if you, if you think of a school year, a lot happens over the summer, a lot happens in the fall leading into uh, like early, late winter. When we get towards um, April, May, and June, and we're wrapping up the school year, everybody is, ramp especially at our level, is ramping up and getting ready for the, the end of the year activities, whether it be AP exams, regents exams, the end of the year celebrations, graduation. So what we did is we, we assigned activities to the major activities to this assistant principal where they would be mostly free from a major major responsibility point of view in the fall and summer. So most of their activities were going to be centered, the major activities, I keep saying major, because the day-to-day -day activities obviously are the brunt of the, are the brunt of the work with discipline and uh, student monitoring of students. But like I said, so what we're doing is we're shifting the testing and, and uh, the testing co-curricular, those kind of things into this position. And some of the one, the duties that kind of are taxing either through the year or into the summer are gonna be spread out between the other two assistant principals and myself. Mike, did you see Seema's comment in the chat? No. Or question? Ask, so they will work on this point 3D um, diversity and equity in the summer and fall and then spend the rest of the year on testing? No, I guess, see, see I guess the way you explain it is like, okay, if, if you are, if you're the assistant principal in charge of scheduling, the scheduling team starts meeting in 
the beginning of February. And it is weekly, every week until really until the end of summer school is when scheduling wraps up um, because we have to take in consideration with the success rate out of summer school and you know adjusting the master schedule from there. If you look at the other um, the other major duty that we're looking at is is focus and alt ed and and um, our CTE program and all the alternative programs and intervention programs that is going on throughout the school year and demands a lot of time throughout the school year. What we shifted is I shifted testing to this assistant principal, which the AP testing starts up in late April, early May and the regions testing kicks in big time into June, obviously. So there's, a, there's work that starts obviously in the March, April timeframe where you're starting to build that schedule and the special ed accommodations that have to happen for that. But it is more focused towards the end of the year, which should free up the person to have more time to devote to these activities throughout the rest of the school year. Um, I, I have two questions. Uh, I, I don't remember if it was Damien or somebody else said they had attended something like some program. I think it was at like Harvard in the summer for um, diversity. And it was really, I think, awesome if I remember hearing correctly. Can this person, whoever's hired in this position, is there a commitment from the district that they can also send this person there? It sounds like it was worthwhile and probably worth the money. It was. I went to that. It was two years ago, I think I went to that SEMA. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely make that a, a point of priority for this position that they get extensive professional development going into this. I think, you know, as Marie alluded to, the hiring process itself is an opportunity for us to, you know, try to identify the person who has the greatest capacity to do this role. But this is not a role that's going to be uh, stagnant by any stretch of the imagination. I think, as Marie said, you know, we need somebody who is a learner in this role. We need somebody who's able to uh, continue to engage in their own growth and their own reflection and their own development as they go forward. And, and hopefully this is something that we can expand over time. Um, but yeah, good point. And I think that's that's definitely a commitment that we would make. Thank you, Damien. Um, so Marie, so it sounds like you can make a commitment to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we are all working on our professional development in this area, you know, all the time. But I think to search out those particularly powerful learning experiences. Harvard is one, but there are others out there. And this is a good use of title monies, for example, or grant funds, because it's one-time expenses that won't hit our operating budget. Um, and money for professional development, I think you've seen in several categories. So we would have the resources in order to provide that professional development. That's, that's great, look forward to that. Barb, what did you mean by racial profiling? Um, you said that in your question. Uh, people were just saying, uh, by making your diversity part of that position, are you basically just looking for a person of color? Uh, or are you looking for the most qualified person, uh, such as Dr. Horalchuk was, who doesn't meet that definition but did a phenomenal job and you know and now i'm hearing that we want to expand the position next year so first of all you know i think we have to show with our equity audit that for some reason or other our our district is in arrears and our teachers diversifying their teaching style enough to accommodate the needs of the poor, the English language learner, the person of color. Um, you know, we've had anecdotal evidence of a number of incidences over a number of years, um, but I think professional development, the way Amy was, was setting it up and making sure that our teachers were aware of the needs of the students. And I, I really believe most of our teachers are doing a great job in, in that regard with their differentiation and knowing the needs of the students. Um, I think the concern is that you're, you're going to look for a candidate um, 
you know, like some of the people that are on our diversity, uh, equity and inclusion committee that have had experience in this and they just happen to, to all be people of color. Now, I'm sure there may be diversity officers out there that aren't, but all the articles that we've read and uh, they've pointed in that one direction. And I, I think people just want to be reassured that you're going to hire a person for this position that is qualified in all the aspects that Marie, you know, pointed out. And that just the, the one aspect of having had some education or experience in diversity training um, is sort of the highlight of that position. Uh, I, I think as Marie described it, uh, I think people will be very, very comfortable that she said, you know, they have to be learners, they have to X, Y, and Z, and gave a nice explanation of what she's looking for in that position. And I, I think I'm very comfortable with that, and I suspect most people would be. But that that's what I was referring to. Is that what you meant, Dr. Wiles, with the racial profiling in the question? Um, I I wouldn't have thought about it in the context of racial profiling. Um, I mean, I think this is a position where we want someone to focus on equity in all of its forms. So um, it, it's really, when we think about equity, it's how do we serve each and every student where he or she is? And some of our students will, you know, need need more than others. And But I think that crosses um, a lot of categories. It's not just race. And you know we're gonna we're gonna put the ad out there. We're going to see who we get. We're gonna go through our process um, and and hire the person who can best meet the needs of our of our students. That that's the process that we would use. So there's not a priority for race. I understand it's all equity and all diversity, but there's no priority for race. Correct? That's what you're saying. I'm well. I will say that we have a priority in all of our hiring to create a more diverse workforce. Um, that's a stated goal for the board. It's a stated goal for um, in my own goals that you folks approve for me. Mr. Johnson and I are thinking about it all the time. Um, but in the end, we we need to hire the people who can best meet the needs of the district. So. Um, how that plays out is a function of the candidates that we attract. I would love to see the hiring, um, I guess the creative practices that you guys are using to try and uh, recruit diverse staff and faculty. I look forward to it. We're working on it. Um, Kelly and then Gloria. Hi, sorry for my like Blair Witch Project appearance here. I'm outside and can't go inside. Um, I think point three is low for uh, our diversity and equity thing, but I, I, I like it that it's in there um, because I think there'll be some accountability of that position rather than not having just hiring somebody and assuming they were doing that. I'd like to see the accountability with that point three, like, like you had mentioned, and I like increasing it for the next year. Um, I have a lot of things to say that I could possibly say right now, but I'm not, I'm not going to, but I don't, I don't think you guys are going to racially profile the position. I think you're going to find the best person. I think that's <laughs> one of the reasons we need this position there. <laughs> um, it's kind of yeah, I'm a little bit speechless, but, um, I think we need to keep it. I think we need to keep it in the position with a rubric that can it can be assessed to uh, in the future. And I think increasing it would be a good idea. So I, I agree with it just being a start. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thanks. Gloria, I think you're next. I guess I was wondering what your thinking was, um, how this person, the, the AP position would be involved with the DEI committee, with the task, you know, the, the committee that we have, because that's, going to be a crucial I mean that's basically the committee that's getting going now and I, I'm you know I'd like to see a bigger position too but I think point three is reasonable in terms of our committee is just getting started we're going to begin to see the results of you know some sort of internal audit and directing ourselves and where we want to go and that if that person's you know in, intricately involved with the committee then we can be pointing the direction 
uh, helping to to establish that as a and then that position might have to grow depending on what our you know what we find. Um, uh, I'll just speak for myself. I see that as a critical part of the role to help anchor the committee's work um, and to be some of the engine behind the committee work. Because when you look at the rest of the committee, it's volunteers. And um, I mean, obviously you have, you know, the district office team and, and me and we're doing the work, but um, it would benefit from having a person on staff who had a, uh, this is part of your regular job to help with that. Now, what that exactly looks like with the committee, I think is worth the conversation. Um, but I think as the equity audit is, is underway, there's a ton of work connected with that. Um, I think there's some uh, communication liaison work that could be um, really helpful. Um, I think there's room to discuss with that committee how best could we use this individual to help advance its work and coordinate its work so things don't fall through the cracks. That's my number one worry about the committee because it's a lot of people doing work in in small groups and it's really hard to glue everything back together. Um, and so that's a key role that I would see. The, the other thing I kind of feel positive about is that as, as you've mentioned, Amy and you know anybody in those AP positions, we have gotten tremendous results from those positions. I mean, people have taken on in a direction and done magnificent work. So our history shows us that you know we people in those positions that we have hired have been able to balance you know some some high priority types of things. So I feel you know definitely good about that that piece of it. Thanks, Gloria. Um, Barbara, and then back to Seema. Two totally different questions. Um, is summer school in the budget? I know summer school is one of the things that the federal funds could be used for, but in the event that uh, that doesn't happen, do we have money in for summer school? And how many um, TA positions do we have uh, that we can tap into if COVID hits again so that we're not pulling out our reading teachers and all these others, you know, um, to do cohorts? So there's um, a couple answers to the summer school piece. Uh, one, because there's lots of forms of summer school. So summer school for general education students, like high school students who need to make, a, make up a course is in the budget that we've been presenting. Um, Lisa Knowles and her team also provide extended school year programming um, why don't you talk a little bit about how that works, Lisa? Well, it's this typical program we run every summer for our students with significant needs who may demonstrate regression and without six weeks of programming, we need, would, would be unable to maintain their skills. So it's uh, the population is considered through each committee on special education process and students are recommended through the CSE process to participate in our extended school year program. And it's funded by? I, funded, How is it funded? Uh, primarily, Neil might have to help me with this answer. Um, it is budgeted as well as we get um, funding from the state after the fact. So that is correct. Mm -hmm. It's built into our current budget. And then Damien's been working with some of our teams to talk about some enhanced summer programming, particularly this summer, for our students who may have experienced some learning loss. Damien, do you want to jump in? I know that plan has been evolving. Yeah, it's been evolving. We have a task force that's actually actually meeting on Friday. Um, basically, what we're trying to build is a K through eight summer bridge program for both reading and math. Um, the program would be specifically targeting. I think one of the first bullets was around learning loss. Um, specifically targeting students who may have struggled throughout the course of this year or regressed over the course of this year. Um, so it will be, you know, really directed at those students who have had a difficult time over the course of this year. Um, we have built that actually into the first round of federal funds, the CARES Act. So the CARES Act is going to be the primary financial uh, support for that program. It will be a six week program and it's probably going to run four days per week over the course of the six 
next six weeks. And again, it's going to focus primarily on reading and math at this point. So uh, we're building the ship, but we will have that in place for the course of the summer. And that funding has already been approved for uh, use for that program. Uh, Damien, does that include transportation for the students? It does not. And we have a couple of challenges this summer, specifically around the capital project and the availability of our spaces. So we're going to, unfortunately, we're going to have to rely largely on some remote options for the summer. So transportation may not factor in to a great degree. Mm -hmm. um, because again, we, we have a lot of construction that's taking place this summer that's going to limit our access to our spaces. Actually, it's not just the pandemic and COVID, but just availability of space this summer. And then Barbara, you'd asked about unassigned TAs, correct? Yes. Neil, uh, you I just could I just pop in oh sure, sure. That, that I'm a little disappointed to hear that it has to be remote because that's where so much lost learning has happened with kids sitting in front of computers and not having the attention span, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's no way we can uh, put them in tents outside or rent space. Barbara, I, I understand that, but I think there's also, there's another perspective with that too. I mean, we have a, a large number of students who have been operating remotely throughout the course of this year that we've actually had a great level of success with. Um, that's not too often spoken, but we have a, a number of reading teachers and math specialists who are working specifically in a remote environment with students who have had a lot of growth and a lot of progress with those students. So we think we have enough to build from, um, enough that we've learned from over the course of the summer. We, you know, we did discuss the idea of uh, potentially building in some in-person opportunities there, but we're gonna have to be strategic about that because we simply don't have the space to be able to do that. So I understand that it's not ideal, um, but again, it's one that we we also have found some levels of success. So we hope to be able to learn from that and be able to to build upon that. But I know what you're saying. And would it be available to any parent that thinks their child has fallen behind or just no, be it would, it would be or... it would be really based on progress metrics and and you know assessments that we've had over the course of the year. We wouldn't be able to open it up to all parents, so it's going to target specific students who we have been monitoring over the course of the year. Um, you know, both our language arts cabinet and our math cabinet are working with classroom teachers and looking at all the assessment information and data right now for us to be able to, uh, you know, identify those students that we really want to to target. And then we know have had some difficult yeah. times over the course of this this school year. So it will be a targeted population, not a general population. We don't have enough to open it up to everyone. We just, we wouldn't be able to accommodate that. Thank you. Sure. And the TAs, Marie, you were gonna talk about? Um, Neil, can I, I know you just looked that one up for us. Yeah, it's, it's four, four positions on assigned for TAs in special education aids combined. Mm. Um, Kelly, do I see your hand? Or is that from before? There she is. Nope, sorry. I had to come inside and no, it's from before, thank you. Okay, thanks. Are there other questions? Ben? Um. So I have a first a comment and then a question um, on on the issue of the tax cap, right? Um, you know, my cons how I kind of view it, right? And granting that every year we need to grow as much as we can in order to be able to grow as much as we can next year because you know two percent percentages are compounding. And if we had been a quarter percent less over the past five years, we'd have, you know, less money in the budget now. Um, but my understanding of the relationship between the school district and the wider community is not that we get to go up to the tax cap every year, um, but that we take what we need. Uh, otherwise, we would just make that automatic, right? Automatically, we'd go up. 1.28% or 1.55% or 2%. Instead, we can go lower 
or we can go higher with with the consent of of more people um and so for me the 1.7 fte from the high school that is we're losing because of attrition we have less students um i really feel like we need to give that back um to the community because you know next year we might want some extra flexibility but if covid comes again right 1.7 FTEs isn't going to make a difference anyway um four FTEs isn't going to make a difference anyway and so you know looking at what we did this year uh with four extra FTEs and four extra TA FTEs um bearing in mind that when that structure was suggested um back last March, uh, we also had six elementary classes that were at the guideline, had the little stars next to them. So we still have six classes. And so it's unclear to me why we would need more unused money in our budget. It, it's unclear to me why we would be going up to our tax cap with $630,000 of unassigned FTEs sitting in our budget. Um, and so, you know, I, I feel strongly that at least that 1.7 that we lost from attrition, because I love that we have this, this flexible FT model, but I don't think that like when we don't need money anymore, that we can just hold on to it because, you know, in the future, maybe we want to grow more. Um, so, so that's my comment there. And then my question is, uh, last year I proposed some some cuts to per pupil allocations um, that we have in our budget appendices. And I, and I got a, an answer um, that, you know, we were talking specifically about textbooks, textbook budget line. I had looked back five years at old budgets. Um, that money had never come close to being touched. And I was told that, well, that's because it wasn't always used for textbooks. Sometimes it was used for te technology. It's a broad, aidable category. Um, but reflecting on that question, right, um, and this this popped in my head because I saw that, um, you know, that the per pupil allocation for textbooks had actually been increased uh, at the elementary level um, this year. I'm not, I, I was I was hoping that that could be explained again, and that you know more specifically it could be explained why why the budget line doesn't show this money being spent, even if it's not on textbooks, it could be on technology. And then if it's not being spent from that budget line, why isn't that money being allocated to a different budget line in our budget if we know we're going to use it to buy computers instead of uh, textbooks? Neil, do you want me to start on that? So Ben, um, just I don't remember the exact question last year, but I'm, I'm kind of hypothesizing what it was. Um, Basically, how things work. I mean, first off, let me assure you this: the money is spent every year, and it's spent fairly intentionally because it is an aidable budget line that is based on expenditures. So, if we don't expend that money, um, we basically lose the potential aid revenue that comes in the following year that is based on the previous year's expenditures. So, it used to be years ago that each bucket of textbook hardware software essentially instructional software and instructional hardware were their own separate categories um a number of years back i don't know when it was seven eight nine years ago they kind of put it into and neil you can correct me if i'm wrong here but they basically put it into this kind of broader aidable category where those three particular buckets could be interchanged a little bit so for example, if you did not utilize all of your textbook money in one given year, you could reallocate that money into instructional hardware or instructional software, um, but still gain the aid in the next year based on the prior year expenditures. So we do that every year. In fact, we just did it a few weeks ago with remaining textbook money that we had under this year's budget, which was reallocated or transferred into the aidable hardware category which enabled us to actually start to purchase some additional replacement devices that we desperately are in need of across our district. Um, Barbara kind of alluded to that earlier that we've been you know, waiting for new devices, but uh, when we have this flexibility across those three aidable categories, 
if we have identified needs that emerge that may be in the technology world, but we haven't expended all of the textbook money, that gives us an opportunity to, number one, address the need, but number two, at the same time, not lose any aid in the following year based on expenditure-driven aids. Um, so it's it's one of those things that we're very intentional to make sure that we're we're maximizing the, the aid that we're going to receive in the following year. Um, but you're right. I mean, historically, we see, and, and I think that's something that's been a trend over the course of the past decade or so, that there's less expended, not in every year, and a good example would be a few years ago when we put a new math program in at the elementary level, that basically consumed textbook right off the bat. Um, but in most years, there's usually textbook money that remains. It doesn't mean it's not used though. That money is absolutely going to be used to address needs in other areas needs in other aidable areas, specifically around hardware and software. Um, so I, I hope that kind of adds to the understanding of what that is and why, you know, why it is that, that it might appear that we're not using textbook, but I assure you we're absolutely using the funds that are allocated there. So, so there's separate line items for hardware and software in our budget. And yes. All three are aidable. Correct. So why so again, I mean, just looking back at past years and how we we don't really come close to, to using the textbook money for textbooks, why don't we see higher numbers in the hardware category and lower numbers in the textbook category? Like You like, won't at the beginning of the budget year, but you will toward the end of the budget year when we have a better understanding of what might be still available in textbooks. So. I mean, if you go back, I don't know, a few weeks ago, three weeks, a month ago, you would see that I did a budget transfer from remaining textbook into hardware, specifically for that purpose, so that we could address some additional needs that we had in hardware, um, not by using any new money, but using money that was still available there. So if you look at the end of the year, you're going to see a very different picture than what you see at the very start of the budget year, based on what might still about be available within those aidable categories. I understand that. My concern is that the the budget that is presented is is supposed to bear some resemblance to the money that we're going to spend this year. Um, and so, you know, if 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 it, it tells a story, right? And right now, the story that this budget is telling is that we spent a lot of money on textbooks um, when it sounds like we spent a lot of money on hardware. And so, you know, my concern is that, you know, we're um, taking a per pupil allocation number, we're putting in the appendies, it's going into the budget formula, and that after many years of not using that budget line item and transferring it to other categories, we haven't recalibrated the per pupil allocations or recalibrated where that money goes in the budget to tell the story of what our district's currently doing. And so then you get, times like these, when board members are looking through the budget, trying to find areas to, to save money. And, um, you know, we, we bring it up and it's like, oh, we never use that money in that category. We, you know, it, there's always some left over and we use it in hardware and they're both aidable. And so don't worry about it. Well, then, then how do I know what I'm voting on? You know, if, if the story that's being told here in this budget is not the story that we even anticipate being told this coming year. Um, is, is really the essence of my, of my question. Are, are we making those adjustments regularly uh, to, to what we're allocating money to in, in by line item? Or are we just saying, oh, this is all aidable, it doesn't really matter. And, and if so, okay, but, but I wish that there was a way to actually combine those line items or something so that um, you know, we, we know what's happening. So it sounds. Sorry, I was going to say, it just sounds like um, your question, Ben, is a lot about can we anticipate now how that big pot of money will ultimately be divvied up across those categories? Is that essentially what you're asking us to to be more accurate in projecting? So let I'll just use round numbers. Let's say it's two hundred thousand um, dollars. 
you know, are we going to spend 75 here and 25 here and 100 there? I kept the math very simple because right now we're putting the whole 200 in one place. And then as the year unfolds, it gets reallocated based on um, kind of the the costs we have with hardware and then other emerging needs. I mean, we can certainly work on that in our stage two discussions with our with our leadership team. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, um, like I said, I'm not doubting that the money's being spent and it's not being spent on things that we need. Um, but I mean, you look at the budget, we haven't come anywhere close to even 75% of our per, per people allocations for textbooks. And so last year I suggested cutting down to 75% of what we had only to learn that like that money actually isn't for textbooks. That's it's for something else. And obviously it's hard for us to do our job if we don't know what we're voting on. Well, Ben, I think it's a great point and we'll, we'll bring that back and build it into our stage two discussions next year and try to anticipate really where do those resources ultimately need to end up. Maria, I think if uh, over the years, what Ben is saying, if most of the money is spent in hardware, then increase that line and decrease the, the textbook line. I, I think that's what he's saying. So we, we actually have done that, though. I, I just I want to be clear. That's something that, again, going back probably eight, nine years, I started doing when I came into this position because I was making the same kind of an observation that we weren't um, exhausting that textbook money um, for a long number of years, honestly. So when the state gave us the flexibility to make some movement between those three aidable categories, um, Neil and I started working together and we made some adjustments on that right off the bat. So we had kind of an adjusted textbook slash hardware expenditure plan that made early adjustments, but I think we were very cautious also to not um, deplete the textbook category because there are expenditures that take place over the course of the year, like our elementary classroom libraries, for example, are very reliant on that. Um, so there have been adjustments made, not to say that we can't make more adjustments with that, but I think we've tried to refine that process once the state gave us, gave us the flexibility to do some, uh, some work across the three aidable categories, not just have them as you know, distinct separate buckets of, of aidable funds. But we can continue to refine that and continue to work on that. Are there other questions? I'd like to just uh, share my thoughts on everything. Um, first, overall, I'm, I'm relieved that uh, we actually don't have to pull any money from our reserves this year. That was something that was very concerning to me. So I think that's it's massively relieving that the state has kicked in enough money where we actually have a balanced budget. Um, second, in regards to the AP position, uh, to be blunt, I'm not in favor of it. You know, looking at the thought exchange, many people in our community were not in favor of additional administration. I see the need for it. I also, uh, I see the need for a diversity and equity position. However, I don't think a point three is gonna be nearly enough. We're asking someone to do what really should be two jobs. And when we ask them to do that, they're not gonna be able to fully complete the duties of either one. So it's gonna be difficult to find someone who has that kind of expertise. Uh, I'm sure we can, but it, it's gonna be difficult. And having them try to do two jobs at once is gonna be really difficult. So that's just my thoughts on that. Um, Seema, then Rebecca, and then Blanca. Um, I think I said it before, and I agree with Luciana that it's not going to be easy to find somebody uh, to, that can do both. I kind of think that you're setting them up for not really success. I don't know about failure, but not really the best path to success. The second um, question I have is, so we have money for unassigned, but were there people let go this year? I know at least of one teacher, correct, that was, um, that was, uh, not fired, but like there was no room in the budget to keep them. I know at least of one teacher. 
in, in your high school. I'm just kind of wondering, like, why are we putting money towards undesigned and not keeping them? Um, there may have been some part-time people who did not re come back. Yeah, I think it, at the high school it was all portions of positions, Seema. It was, um, we didn't have any full-time people whose positions were eliminated. There wasn't anyone in social studies that was full-time that was eliminated? No, it was a portion of the position, which is going to result in them having to move to in the middle school. There's, and that's a whole seniority um, issue more so. There's a vacancy in the middle school that that person would be eligible for, but the part-time position would have to be hired for at the high school. So it went from a full-time position to a part-time position. But there were people that left, correct? I mean, that's assuming that they will apply. So there's a shifting, I mean, I guess you can explain however you want, but I mean, somebody I know that was a student who's not there anymore. So I feel like we're not, you know, kind of to the bigger point that Ben is making is that we're voting on things that we don't have the exact details about. I mean, even last meeting was pretty much a Q and A session that was already set. So any of the question, you know, I think, Ben was actually trying to do the, the right thing by giving a heads up as to the questions that he was asking. But I think a lot of the questions that we're asking, we're not really getting the detailed answers to. And so you guys are putting us in this position to vote. And this happens, this is not the first time, this happens a lot that we're voting on things without details. And we ask you questions for details and we're not really getting clear answers. Um, and you know, I, I also try and ask ahead of time, but it makes, it puts me in that position of, I don't want to ask ahead of time because now I'm getting these like answers that are practiced ahead of time and I'm not getting, we're not getting a real answer. So it's almost like, you know, a dog and pony show when it's um, being streamed to the public. So it's just disappointing that, you know, this, this is, this continues. People have said that before they left the board, I've tried to stay positive and I've tried to stay positive too, Gloria, about some of the work that's being done. But I mean, the last time we talked about this at an evening meeting, literally the next day, and we all know we can't talk about it um, because some of this is confidentiality, but a racial epithet was said to a student and then we're sitting here like, yeah, let's, we're doing a great job. No, we're not doing a great job. And the, I, I know you wanna shake your head, Gloria, but I guess I'm getting sick of it as somebody who sits here year after year hearing about the same things and being asked to vote on things that we don't really have the details on. You know, and I disagree with people who have made comments and, you know, Ben and I don't always disagree or agree on, on things, but I am in complete agreement here that we're asked every year to vote on things that we don't have details on. And it's, it's, not, it's not really, you know, it's not really right to ask the public to do that when we're asking you questions with taxpayer money and then you guys don't give us, you know, real answers. It's, it's a disappointment. Um, Rebecca, and I'm happy to provide any more additional detail, any of us are, um, but Rebecca, I'll, I'll turn to you for the next question. It's not really a question, it's just a comment. And I know I, I said this at the last meeting, I agree with um, Sima and Luciano. I really think the DEI position should be 0.5 or more. Or more. I think having it be 0.5 or less dilutes it. Uh, and I realize I'm echoing what other people have already said, but I, I really think it should be 0.5. Uh, Gloria? Sorry. Um, I mean, I would love it. I would love it to be full time. Uh, 0.5 would be great as long as we can afford it. You know, if we can find the money for it, I would, I would support it. I, I'm looking at this budget and saying, uh, what are the priorities that were set? Do I agree with them? Um, and I do. Could we do everything? No, we can't do it all. Am I disappointed we can't do everything? Yes. Um, but I'm I'm willing to give this at least a try. Uh, and you know, Seema, I'm not Pollyanna about you know we're doing the right things all the time. We try. We move ahead. We make mistakes. We back up. And and I've seen that time and time again over the many years I've been here. I have to disagree with your feelings, I guess a number of you have uh, expressed that we don't get the details. I felt tonight, we, I mean, I don't know what else people could do uh, in terms of giving information, 
we ask questions. I think the questions are great. I mean, there's, I, I've learned a lot just by listening to that piece, but I think people have been very fair in terms of being here to give, to give the information. If it's not sufficient, then we ask another question or figure it out. I, I don't get a sense that people are stonewalling us or whatever the words we use. Seema, I'm not sure. Um, I, didn't say I, don't get that, I don't get that feeling, but you know, I respect the fact that, you know, I respect what you're saying and I know you're speaking, you know, your, your feelings, but I personally do not get that sense. Uh, I think people have, you know, gone out of their way to, to listen to us. Uh, I think we've worked well together, but we don't always agree. And in the end, we decide with the board. So if we want it a certain way, then we move that way. Um, it's not going out of the way though. That's, this is part of the job is that we ask questions and that- Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't I, think that we, need to, we need to be like extra appreciative because people are asking or answering questions. But I also think that we're not always getting full answers. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see that. I mean, I think people are giving the answers they can. Some things are hard to predict. You give the best you can. I mean, you give the accurate information. If you found something out that was a lie or something, but I think people are honestly giving us the answers that they have. Are they what we want to hear? Maybe not. We're talking about this, this DNI stuff or the equity and diversity and equity or whatever you want to call it. The same thing. We're talking about the work that Dr. Alchek did. She's not there anymore. You right. can't depend on one person. I would hope that somebody, you know, from the top, you know, sends, you know, this message down and gets things going. I see Ms. Yuna do this from their district office and the superintendent. I know there's pushback, but I know they think it's the right thing to do. And so they move forward with it. I'm just, you know, I, there have been more board members who have been on here who've left and are always disappointed with the, like the week. Uh, the weak motions, the weak uh, decisions that the district has made and the, the board not being uh, pushing enough. And we keep pushing on it and we get the same, you know, watered down answers, not clear answers. And to be honest, it sounds like a lot of lip service. I feel like this is going into my seventh year. This is uh, comments made for years and years. And, and maybe, you know, like I said in the public comment, there's maybe a couple of administrators who I see do the work. It's one thing to say something, but to do the work. And then there are other people who don't do anything. And, you know, then we're supposed to vote on this position and hope that they care about the work. Um, and then they're already hired. It doesn't matter. You know, it's just disappointing. And we see it, you know, year after year. I have to laugh because it's like, what else are we going to do? Like, I'm being asked from the district office to, you know, be polite to people who are disrespectful and racist to me and to probably other people in the district. And then, um, I see no support from from up above. It's just it's just really disappointment. Blanca, I think you've had your hand up. A lot has been said since I had my hand up, so um, I'll circle back to. I, that I agree with Ben and Luciano, particularly Ben. Um, I almost feel like he read my mind in Spanish and then said it all beautifully in English. So thank you, Ben. Um, and I share some of Seema's concerns and sentiment. I thought at first it was perhaps because I'm new, but um, I definitely um, agree with Seema with some of her points. I will also circle back to the um, position I'm just going to put this out there. Should we perhaps define the position better before we go ahead and pass funding for it and post it? And also, I seem to recall I was not part of those that phone conversation where we had students that had had um, had experienced racism in the district. I, I was not part of that. I had just started, but I think I remember that some of the concerns from parents and students were that there was institutional racism in the district. And so um, this is just my question. I'm gonna leave that out there. How can we be sure that the administration or the district that has been called out or accused of being racist in the past, that they're going to be able to hire someone for a diversity inclusion position 
unless it's really defined really well. So I'm just gonna put that out there because I do remember that being a concern, I think. Well, this position would be one that would include, um, we would include board member or two on the interview committee and we would welcome board members participation and perspective. Um, I don't know who was next. I think maybe Gloria, then Kelly. Well, I, I just want to say that I remember um, a few of the workshops that I uh, attended in NISBA on the diversity uh, piece. One of the big points that was made was that the interview process needs to be examined and looked at. And I think I think you mentioned this once before, Marie, about the kinds of questions that are asked, the direction of the questioning, uh, the support that's offered to people to encourage them to come because people might not be welcome, you know, feel welcomed. Uh, so there, there were some, you know, really important points made uh, at at the workshops that I attended, and I think some of the people on our committee actually mentioned it too, that uh, you just can't use the same old interview process and expect to get a different result. Uh, if we want to encourage, uh, you know, people to apply that have this interest and passion, then we need to to relook at our interviewing um, process itself. Kelly? Um, I just wanted to add in the diversity equity position that it, it came out yesterday from the state education department. I'll read it. The Board of Regents is expressing its expectation that all school districts will develop policies that advance diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that they will, that they implement such policies with fidelity and urgency. So a point, if you think of point three is not giving enough fidelity to it, then it shouldn't be decreased or, or eliminated, it should be increased. And we'd have the funding for it. So say we don't we don't not have the funding for it, we have the funding for it. So if we're making a decision to follow the state education department's guidance, then it should be funded fully as a, as a 1.0. We're making a decision right now to make baby steps into this. And that's what the decision is gonna be if we, if we enact this budget and that's, and that's what the decision is gonna be but I hope that we increase it next year based upon Department of Ed's guidance. That's it, thanks. Well, I am not quite sure where we go from here. Um, you know, typically we have the worksheet um, that spells out kind of our the district's most recent uh, recommendation for how we go forward and someone would make a motion and then um, make suggested amendments and, until we get to a place where uh, we have um, uh, a proposal that can come to a vote. So I, I don't know if we're ready to do that at this point. Gloria, your hand up. Uh, yes, thanks, uh, Seema. Uh, Neil, what would the cost be for um, making the AP the AP position full time, which we do need that? Um, and what would the cost be for a full time uh, diversity and equity and inclusion? You muted, Neil. Is he talking? He was. Oh. <laughs> Twice tonight. Sorry. Um, give me a minute. Let me. Do magic. your magic. Do your magic. <laughs> yes. Uh, 12 month position salaries and benefits. Um, I come up with like 113, 800. 113, 800. Yeah. With salary and benefits, it's assuming $85,000 for a salary. Okay. And then benefits on top. 
12 month position. So that's for the uh, AP or the DEI? Well, the AP would remain. I mean, we really have a 1.0 in there. It was more okay. split responsibilities. Okay. So the addition would be 113.8. So there, there's our, uh, I mean, if this is something, that's what I've been hearing from people, that this is an issue. And if it is an issue that people feel strongly we need to move this year on, then can we put this in the budget and what do we take out or what do we not fund? And I mean, that's that's the quandary. You know, I, I personally would love to see a full time, but what do we, you know, how do we balance it? Well, does the district have ideas as to what, you know, should be taken out? Well, I would suggest um, that we would reduce our unassigned. I mean, the 1.7 came from the high school. This in effect would put most of it back to the high school. And it may not use that entire 1.7 because I know, I know we're not talking about start time, but right. um, you know, one of the things that we thought about with those unassigned were some programming options for our middle schoolers before school starts, regardless if we move start time. Um, but that's kind of a late breaking idea. But um, if we could have a 1.0 FTE focused on equity and diversity and inclusivity, that's where I would take it. That would work, Neil, in terms of the amount? Yes. Then uh, what? what's the stage now? We have to motion, we have to put a motion on the floor to accept the, and then put the amendment in? All right, I'll, I'll motion that we- uh, Hold on one second, Gloria. Does anybody have what? any, does anybody have any interest in taking it from the fund balance rather than taking away from an additional FTV? I just want to throw that out there. Getting no's. Okay. You made a, Can I ask a question, actually. So the current the current proposed model was 0.7 for an associate, an assistant um, principal, and 0.3 for DEI, right? So. Are we are we proposing two 1.0 positions? So a 1.0 assistant principal and a 1.0 DEI. So are we adding time to the assistant principal position? The first thing. The first. It was what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Two distinct Wait. positions. Rebecca, that makes no that you said so what you just said it was one a point seven for a assistant principal and of that point seven, a point three would have been the DEI. Is that what the initial one was? No, no. Was it one point oh? Okay. Point seven AP point three um equity university. So can we keep the point seven AP and just we would make the one point oh doesn't that save us a point three? That's my point. Yeah. Well I don't think you want a point seven AP. I don't know what that that's what we were going to have. That's what we were going to have when we were just. No, but no, but they have a full time position. They would just have a. They'd have a one point oh. But now you're going to just hire a point seven AP. Well, I think that's, that's her point. I think that is Kelly's point, right? Is that's what we were paying someone to do was a point seven. Yeah, position. but the fact, but they would be a full time person, but only part of their time would be directed a certain way. They'd still be involved in the school community and with kids. That's a very different situation right. than having point seven person not right. there all the time. No, I, I, I mean, I don't agree with that. So are you making that motion, Gloria, then to have 1.0 for both and take take it out of the unsigned? Yeah, that's, you know, for, first I think we have to put the budget on, first we have to vote. We have to, what's the first vote we have to have? Well, it's a, I think a motion to um, approve, adapt approve the budget the and then and then we take amendments. Okay. Well, I make a motion that we adopt the budget as presented. Give me a second. Barb? Okay. Now, now we can propose the amendment? Yes. My suggestion that I, I put out there for an amendment would be to change it to an AP position at the high school of 1.0 and make the DEI, or whatever we're calling it, diversity and equity position uh, 1.0. 
and that would re also reduce the um, the 1.7 uh, extra extra uh, position at the high school. Take that out. You mean taking it from the unassigned? The That's what I meant. I couldn't think of the word. Yes, unassigned. <laughs> And Barb, were you seconding it? Can Barbara, I think you're muted. I, I seconded the motion to approve the budget, and then I have my hand up to talk to them to the amendment. I think we needed a second first. Kelly, did you sec? Oh, we're back. Okay. Go ahead, Barb. Oh, if we're doing the two positions, first of all, again, my problem is we haven't demonstrated a need for a full-time position. If we want to start with a point three, see how things progress, and not just assume that you need a full-time position for your DEI person. Um, those unassigned positions that we've had it's been my experience, I think over the years, and Marie can either corroborate or, or disprove my point, those unassigned positions for the most part have been used over the course of the school year, particularly with the class size situations. Uh, the same with the high school uh, situations. They oftentimes use like a point two for a, an extra AP English or whatever. So we're tying a lot of things in here that sort of trouble me. We had um, Mike Piscatelli arguing desperately that he wanted the position, uh, the AP position, you know, to start off with it with the point three, as I said, just as as a starting point. Again, we haven't even had our equity audit as to the needs and how great these needs are. You're talking a, a six figure salary when you add the position, um, the medical benefits, the travel recruitment benefits. Uh, Ms. Kiyuna's um, officer, I believe is definitely in the six figures. And again, Marie may have that actual, actual figure, but that's a heck of a lot of money for a need that you have not really proven on paper yet. And, and again, I, I just, I have even reservations about the point three taken from the um, AP position, but I can see starting there. And Marie's explanation of having a point person um, working with the diversity, equity and inclusion committee, uh, I think is wise because they would be dedicated to that but I really can't support now doing two positions um, when again, there to my mind, hasn't been a demonstrated need on paper that we have to have a full-time position. Um, to me, the needs for an additional social worker um, with all the mental health needs that, that we probably will see coming through uh, to me, it would be far more important than a, a DEI position at this point in time. Um, the point three, to me, is a starting point. Uh, Marie has already indicated that she next year, if it goes well and you know we see a need, would be proposing additional uh, resources in that direction. But I just, I, I know we need those those extra FTEs and. Um, Kelly had a, had a point possibly of leaving those there and maybe taking money out of your fund balance, but then you reduce the fund balance. So um, that's my point. Thank you. Uh, Seema, I think I see your hand. Um, I just think that the position would also probably address, I mean, I, I feel like it falls in line with mental health needs. I don't think they're separate. I also think it falls in line with the board goals and the superintendent goals. And um, Dr. Wiles, in your opinion, is this a position that this district needs? I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, 
you know, you may ask in the original budget, why, why is it only in there as a 0.3? I mean, when we began this budget development process, the financial outlook was like 180 degrees different than it is right now. So the recommendation was trying to balance a lot of needs um, with a lot of realities of what our circumstances are. You know, I'm looking at Mr. Piscatelli, and I know we need to have more than two APs at the high school. So, I mean, it was all about striking a balance. Um, long term, do I think, I mean, I'm projecting forward from Barbara's point of view, would I project forward that there would be plenty of work for this individual to do? The answer is yes. I mean, even in the assistance with the equity audit and all that goes with that. I mean, the other the other elements of this job, like if you look at the document that SED put out today, I mean, it's also has a huge focus on climate and culture within our buildings, mm -hmm. um, which is a huge, a huge part of the work that we need to do. Um, I think the individual could help us and assist um, Regan in our efforts to enhance the diversity of our workforce. I mean, we showed you I, uh, in a recent PowerPoint, the just total lack of diversity in our in our workforce and how you, re you really need to work on that. It's not just happenstance, like who happens to apply. Um, I just think there's a lot of elements of our school community where there is definitely work. And again, it's this is not equity work is not just about serving our children with color, but it's really it's really looking across all of those categories of children who may not feel um, as well supported as they could. So our students in poverty, our our LGBTQ community, our, our students with disabilities. I mean, we, we heard all of that. And I think we can work on more of that if we had an individual who that's what they spent their time doing. But, you know, there was no way in March I was going to suggest a 1.0 FTE when we were in the midst of who knows what. Uh, Barbara, I see your hand. Just a, a quick follow up. You earlier stated about sustainability and that we didn't want to put something into the budget that we couldn't predict down the line if we're going to have the funds for. And again, you're talking a heck of a lot of money here. Um, as I said, probably at least six figures. And that sure can buy a lot of TA time. It can buy a lot of computer time, <laughs> textbooks, et cetera. So I, I just wanted to, to raise that point of sustainability. It's a great point. Um, Kelly, was it? Yeah, well, I mean, for the past how long have we been taking 600 plus thousand dollars out of our fund balance talking about sustainability i think this is something that we value as a community We've, we value it as our board we came up with the board goals it's one of marie's goals don't you want don't you want to make that investment now what were we spending that over a half a million dollars on every single year out of the fund balance i mean we were sustaining stuff with that six hundred thousand dollars let's make a choice of what we want to sustain into the future right now is it something that we value? I mean, it's just it's just a decision we need to make of, of what our values are. And, and we're gonna be net zero here. We're gonna have a balanced budget. If we take $100,000 out of our fund balance or, or whatever we choose to do it, whatever, how we choose to do this, that's a hell of a lot better than $600,000 that we did last year and the year before and the year before. So it's just a choice that we need to make as a, as a community. Luciano? Yeah, so I'm not against having the position, but I'm very concerned about where the money's coming from. Um, I, I'm really thinking back to that thought exchange, and I read many times that the two biggest themes I took away from that are make classes smaller, so class size, and administration is too big. So we're adding to the administration we're taking away FTEs that could be used to make classes smaller. 
taking the money out of the fund balance, I don't think is a good idea going forward. You already have one of the lowest ratios in the suburban council, not, not one of the lowest. So taking that money out of there is dangerous. We don't know what the future is going to hold. Uh, this year has shown that. So we need to be very careful how we do this. I'd rather wait until the, the committee has finished their equity audit and made the recommendations, and we can follow these recommendations next year. But acting tonight, like we, we just talked about this. We've been on it for maybe 10, 15 minutes here. So that's not enough time to really make a, a really well-informed decision. I, I'd rather wait until next year to do it. Um, if we need to do the, the principal, we can discuss that, whether it's going to be, you know, if we do it or if it's going to be a, a full time. Um, I'm just really worried about where this money's coming from and if we're actually doing what the community wants us to do. Sina? Um, okay. Um, Kelly? Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. Sorry, um, I put, put my hand down. I might have a question in a second, but thanks. Okay, I'll let you go after me then, Kelly. Um, things that come up from the public, when the public brings up ideas, I have great respect for. I think we need to listen to. But just because something's said, whether it's by us or the public, doesn't make it true. So I think if we want to move ahead and talk about um, heavy on administration. We just can't assume that just because somebody says it or a number of people think it, that it's the truth. So we need to be very careful there um, about what we do in terms of our administrators because we don't have a lot of them and they're very diversified. We've got them doing like six people's jobs in one. Uh, it's not like the old days, I remember, when one person did one job in administration. Now they've got, you know, five or six different departments and they've got a whole bunch of different um, responsibilities. So they're very complex jobs. Uh, I think we need to be very careful. If you talk about not making a quick decision, I would just because it's said, doesn't make it true. So that's, that's my only point. So we have um, a motion in the second we have an amendment and a second, and we've had some discussion. I, I just want to respond to, to Gloria's point. Um, you know, we just because people say it doesn't mean it's true. Um, and that's especially true of, of community members who maybe don't know what's going on in our schools. Uh, I would I would tend to think that given the amount of of work to be done we don't have too many administrators um, at the same time we're still representatives of the community right and so you know if the community is pro one thing and against something else you do have to take that into account a little bit um, you know for example this this school start time issue uh, i'm very in favor of personally and i I've, I've said that all along um, but I remember, you know, um, debating with Tim Haran years ago that, that if the whole community was against a change in the start time, well, then, then how could I possibly, as a representative of the community, vote for it? So, um, you know, I, I, I understand what Gloria is saying, but, but that needs to be taken with a grain of salt in, in remembering that, you know, it's not, we don't ask them for no reason. We ask them because it guides our actions. Um, Gloria, I think your hand is up again. I think that's the perennial uh, problem, Ben, of a representative type of a government. Uh, you know, the, the, the role of the representative, when people elect someone, uh, are they electing someone to do their will, their own personal, what, you know, what they see? Are they electing the person that they believe will act in good conscience and with all the facts and make the best decision? Or are they electing someone just to represent them and the public votes, and then they just do that? So that's, I think, a, that's been a, a discussion throughout our history. Uh, my, you know, we might all have different takes about that. I think the public should inform us, absolutely. But we also have a responsibility that we were elected by them to do our own duty and make sure that we are informed. 
getting all the information because the community will give us information, research will give us information, other board members will give us information, and then we use that and we come, I believe the public deserves us to come to the best decision that we believe is best for the district, whether or not any constituent group agrees with it. But that I, that I see as our role. So I I'm guess I'm wondering about next steps here. Uh, Blanca? I just want to confirm the um, second position would not increase the budget line. It would not put a further strain on the taxpayers. Right. Not under the proposal of um, taking Florida. the funds from the unassigned pool. Okay. So is the process now to vote on the amendment first? I believe so, yes. Okay, yes. So, um, so we'll take a vote then on Gloria's, um, you, you, um, I'm sorry, you made a motion for the amendment and Rebecca seconded it, correct? Okay, so um, all in favor? Oh, I'm sorry, Martha, do you have a question? Sorry, yes, uh, I'm new at this. Um, did I catch something about this means we're adopting the budget too? No, that's the next. No, just, the, just the amendment. Gotcha. I just want to make sure they weren't sandwiched together. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So um, we'll take a vote on um, Gloria's amendment. Then, all in favor? So, can I just see your hands? It's me, Kelly, Rebecca. Oh, that's five. Okay. All um, against this amendment. Luciano, Barb, and Ben. So passes five three. Now we vote on the other motion on the floor, which is the budget. If there or are no other, other amendments. amendments. Uh, Blanca, do you have your hand up again, or are you sitting down? Okay. Ben has it. Ben, you have your hand up, right? Yes, I would like to make a motion to cut the remaining 0.35 FTE that we're losing by attrition at the high school. Is it Ben made a motion? Is there a second? I, I couldn't hear it, Ben. I propose cutting the remaining 0.35 FTE from the high school that we lost due to attrition from the budget and um, I think we're still taking like $514 from the fund balance. I'd like to pay that back and then give the rest to the tax base. Okay. And Luciana, you seconded it? Yeah. We have a uh, option. Oh, go ahead, Doug. So that's making the, making a whole the assistant principal position as a true AP, right? Without any 0.3 FTV, well, uh, for right. So it's making a 1.0. Is that correct, then? We just made the AP position a 1.0. Okay. Done. So okay. this is we were cutting 1.7. We we had 1.7 FTE from the high school. We took some of those funds to pay for the new diversity position, and I would like to use the rest of those funds. Comes out to be about 0.35 and give them back to the community since we have less students. Barb, do you have a question? Yeah, I have, have a question on that one. We're already reducing the ability of the high school to service the students who may want a, a course. Uh, I don't know, is, is Mike comfortable with that? If you take You've already removed about one point something, and now uh, Ben wants to cut the remainder. Does that leave anything for planning for the high school kids? One of the things that we've heard over and over again uh, on these thought exchanges is that they want uh, the ability to, you know, have their courses at the high school. Uh, this troubles me probably more than the other one. Um, Barbara, I'll jump in just to say that the pool of unassigned is district wide. 
So if there was a need at the high school, we could still go to the unassigned pool. It's not like the high school wouldn't have any unassigned pool to go to. Well, I, I know that, but if you have six, I think you said six classes right on the cusp um, where you wanna maintain the small class sizes. And it just makes me nervous because I know we've used those things so often over the years. You know, we don't always address all six of them because sometimes students move away. It, right. We had six classes on the edge last year with four spare FTEs. Um, and I know obviously this year didn't look like clear, but um, this is this is, brings us back to where we were last year. Four unassigned teacher FTEs, four unassigned so I think there's a motion and a second. Then the discussion is over. Any other questions, I guess? Okay, so um, all in favor then of uh, Ben's uh, proposed amendment. That's uh, three, Luciano, Gloria, and Ben. Okay, all against? All right, so the motion does not pass um, three, five. Seema? Yes. I voted four, but I raised my hand like super late. So it would be four, five. No, there's only eight of them. Four, four. Be four, four. So four, four. Ooh. Right. Okay, now what happens? I don't think it passes if it's tied. It doesn't pass. Yeah. So the motion does not pass four, four. Blanca, put your, put your hand. Do you have a question? Okay. I'm getting confused. Sorry with the hand. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a mess. Uh, I worked all day and I'm a mess on the computer and on my face from my no. goggles. Sorry. No, it's fine. I just wasn't sure. Um, so at this point, you can consider additional amendments or go ahead and vote on the budget. proposed budget. As amended. Does anyone have additional amendments to the, the current uh, proposed budget with this one amendment? Okay, so we can vote then. Um, all in favor of the current uh, proposed budget with this one amendment? All in favor? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, all against? Arm. Okay, the budget, no, the motion passes seven, one. Okay, thank you, everybody. That was a good discussion around mm -hmm. a lot of big topics. Um, the the follow-up action for this is for the board to approve the property tax report card that will follow um, the budget that you just adopted. It's the next item in your packet. Um, Neil, I think it's going to be slightly amended based on the amendment. Is that true? Um, well, the dollars don't change because we're using unassigned for that, correct? Okay. The, oh, yes, you're right. So um, that would be the next mo uh, next action of the board. Okay, thank you. So the can I have a motion to approve the uh, property tax report? Ben, second Barb, any questions? All in favor? It passes 8-0. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wiles. Thank uh, you. We have board president action. Um, there's a few items to uh, vote on first is the impartial hearing officer appointment. And I have a, um, I'll read the resolution. Um, this is resolved at the Board of Ed of the Gillen Central School District 
approves the appointment of James Walsh for a special education and partial hearing pursuant to the board's compensation policy and pursuant to the regulations of the Commissioner of the New York State Education Department, Section um, 200.5. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the uh, hearing officer appointment? Kelly, second Rebecca. Any questions? Okay, all in favor? Ben, did you vote? Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Okay, passes 8 0. Thank you. Uh, next is the Board of Ed a policy adoption. We have a list of policies there, A through um, E. Can I have a motion to approve the policies? Gloria, second, Blanca. Any questions about this? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Passes 8 0. Um, okay. uh, moving on to board committee reports, uh, we'll start with audit, Ben. Thank you. Uh, audit met on Monday morning at 8 a.m. to review some of the corrective action plans that we voted on earlier this evening to some of our internal audits. Um, I, I've discussed this before, uh, how we kind of found um, that we weren't reporting homeless students to the state for reimbursement, things like that. Um, we also reserved our reserve funds um, plan, our, our, you know, um, the specific breakdown by capital fund and TRS and unemployment um, and made sure that we had our plan uh, updated. And um, we finally recommended that, that we agree to um, retain Questar 3 BOCES as our internal auditor. Uh, we felt very comfortable with our auditor this year from there, uh, Alexis Schaefer. Um, we, we really relied on her pretty heavily, um, the board, and, um, and she did a great job interacting with our staff and, and our administration. So we thank her for that, and we're very pleased to um, continue our relationship with Quest Side 3 Boces. Thank you, Ben. Uh, next, we'll have uh, communications. I think, is that Gloria? Yes, it is. Uh, we have not met since our last board meeting, but we are meeting tomorrow after, it's 2 o'clock, Marie? 2.30. Oh, thank you. 2.30, we'll be meeting tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, uh, next is policy. Uh, Barb? Uh, we had a meeting scheduled for this coming Thursday, but that is going to have to be changed, and we haven't met since the last board meeting. Thank you. Uh, business practices, is that Judy? Or is, that, is there somebody else that can speak? Um, uh, um, that is Judy. Okay. We haven't met. Our next nice meeting is scheduled for Monday at 8 a.m. Okay, thank you, Ben. And um, equity and diversity, um, Kelly? We haven't met since our last uh, board meeting. However, we have a meeting next Wednesday. Uh, the 21st at 7 p.m. Thank you. Um, next, uh, we have public comment number two. Linda, do we have any public comments? Thank you. Uh, next, board issues, ideas, and sharing. Does anyone have anything to share? Okay. So I... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Barb. I, I just wanted to share a couple of thoughts with the uh, the lady that was talking about the school start times. Um, this year was obviously a, a difficult year with the 1030 start time for the high school kids. Um, that was not the plan for next year. If we go ahead with this, there would be the 830 start time, which is consistent with Schenectady's uh, Bethlehem um, I think Glen Falls has a, an earlier start time and others are also thinking about it. So it's not like we're outliers here. Um, and we're not trendsetters, we're sort of in the middle. We, are, we know what, what's good. And we have uh, Mike Laster and uh, Mike Piscatelli doing yeoman work on trying to deal with some of the issues that, that were raised um, you know, by the letter writer. So 
again, I think Marie pointed out that we're meeting as a task force, I think next Tuesday. And uh, a lot of those questions I think are, are going to be discussed. Yes. Okay, thank you, Barb. Ben? Yeah, I wanna add to that um, a point that I actually have heard from Barb in the past. Um, you know, some of the some of the feedback that we're getting is to consider all stakeholder groups, right? You know, so don't just think about the high school, think also about the middle schoolers. Um, but I mean, this is a change that we're trying to do for the high school that affects the entire district. And I think it's important to think in terms of an entire district. All of our students will be high schoolers one day, right? And it's in those years that they're taking their their regents, their their um, they're taking their electives based on their interests. They're taking their advanced classes to get college credit. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, elementary school and is important because it's young and fresh and um, you learn the basics and you make friends and um, middle school is important because you're changing and your school is changing with you and you're in different cohorts and you're starting to get some of those extracurriculars um, like sports and music and foreign languages and things like that. And then high school is really, you know, the model that we've had for 150 years of, of this is what school culminates in. So um, they're all part of the journey. And so it's not really like we're slighting middle schoolers or high schoolers. It's more of a this is this is the shape of the journey now that all of us, all of the kids are going to go through. Uh, Can I say something, Seema? Oh. Blanca and Gordon. Sorry. Sorry, Blanca, do you have your hand up? But go ahead, Gloria, because mine is not related. Oh, I just wanted to say I got the, um, I don't know how many of you got to see the Little Women, uh, the virtual mass play it was phenomenal I, I i really kind of went into it thinking how can this be you know watching this on the little computer screen and i was just amazed how you know because i love going to live theater so not having it has been such a loss so seeing those kids and listening to those voices uh and watching the how the technology you know work those scene changes and i, I was just floored uh and i i have to hand it to those kids and and all and the staff who helped, you know, Andy and, and everybody, the crew, they did a beautiful, beautiful job. Thank you, Ablanca? Uh, just uh, new ideas because I don't know how long I'll be on the board. You know, we have the election coming on, so I want a carpe diem. Um, I wonder if the board has ever discussed standardizing homework or perhaps doing away with homework at, at some you know, for the elementary kids or anything like that. I know other districts have explored it. I know entire countries have banned it. Just want to put that out there. I do feel like there is a discrepancy and sometimes it's, it almost, and no disrespect, Neil, but sometimes it feels like it's luck of the draw if you get a teacher that gives a, a, a more homework than another, um, or if it is like varies from house to house. So I just wondered if that's something the board has ever discussed before. And if not, I'd like to propose it's discussed at some point. Um, so we can get back to that balance of, of family life and student life. Um, and then my other topic, which I would like to put out there for future discussion, if possible, is taking a look at what we do with our fifth graders and, as they transition to Farnsworth. That is, adolescence is super hard and it makes absolutely no sense to me and never has um, the way we do things where we separate children from their, you know, most of their friends. And um, I think we need to look at that again, because adolescence is hard enough. And then when you have your support network and you're completely separated from one another, it makes it all that more difficult. So um, it was a problem when I was in school and I see it continuing to be a problem. It's, it's not, Farnsworth is one school, but it really does feel like you're friends are in a different country if they're in a different house. So I think we should look at that again. Thanks. Hey, Barb? I, I just wanted to tell Blanca that prior to COVID, 
uh, the policy committee had begun asking administrators uh, to look at the homework policy because we've heard similar reports. I went to a couple of lectures at our conventions where school districts had pretty successfully, you know, eliminated most homework. So this sounds extraordinarily difficult, but both of these districts felt that it had gone very, very well. So COVID sort of put that on hold because everybody was just trying to survive. So maybe, you know, come next year or over the course of the, the summer or later this year, um, those discussions, you know, can begun to be had again um, on the local school level. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara we I just, just um, met to talk about homework policy. So. Oh, great. Yay. Um, I just come, I want to make a comment, Barb. Um, I, I've always appreciated that you have that institutional knowledge. You know, you, you can recall discussions that have happened because you've been on the board for so long. And so that's great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I see that, do we, we have executive session? I apologize if, no, we don't. Okay. Can I have a, um, a motion then to adjourn? Luciano? Second, Kelly. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 8-0. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.